Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dan Report. I'm John Adarola. Very happy to be joined on this special Thursday 90 minute edition of the show by one of the TDR old timers. Literally, the only thing about him that's old, Dan Evans returns to the show. Dan, how's it going? Good, John. Great to be with you. I've been told I have an old soul, so I guess that's two things. <laughs> yeah, you do. You were like basically the first ever producer for the show way back. I Way back when. Shout out Brett Ehrlich, but yeah, let's say that's true. One and a half, two, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't count. Forget him. He's fine. Uh, he left us. Okay, he's supposed to be doing Fridays, but he's not for a bit. So screw him. I'm taking him out of the history book. His name has been scrawled out of the white book. Anyway, uh, very glad to have you here. Uh, whenever we have a guest on, especially a guest who hasn't been on in a while, we try to make sure that we have content for them to talk about, stories and news and all that that they will be interested in. So. I know that you have a couple of interests. One is, for some reason, Ben Shapiro. The other is checking in. You know, on Meanwhile In, we check in on other countries. Sometimes you like you have a special session of that section of that specifically for Griff Nation. So we got it. some grift for you as well. Yummy for my tummy. Let's go. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for being here, regardless of what platform you're on. Appreciate you being here. We'd appreciate it even more though, were you to hit the like button, share the stream so that people know we're live. Why would you do that? Well, because we're not a right wing outlet, so the algorithm isn't gonna do anything to boost us for some reason. Have you been checking in on Facebook? How that's working? Judd Legum, check him out on Twitter. It's amazing stuff. Anyway, please do that. And as we go through this, we're gonna occasionally be checking in with the audience, see what y'all are talking about. Whether you're tweeting hashtag TDR live over on Twitter, commenting it up in the Twitch, maybe send in some super chats, we'll check in and see what's going on. But I do wanna remind you though, uh, as with every day this week, uh, we're doing 90 minutes now. You know, we're we're gonna grow until eventually there's no break. We're just a 24-hour uh, show. But the reason we're doing that is we want to provide a lead into the awesome Dr. Rashad Ritchie's new show, Indisputable. In the beginning of its eight-week special run on TYT, starting immediately after the damage report at 11:30 a.m. Pacific time, 2:30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, he's had some amazing guests. Jank was on, Killer Mike was on, Senator John Ossoff was on, Adrian Lawrence joined him. Uh, today, they have the former DOJ spokeswoman for the Trump administration and co host of the legal podcast Advisory Opinion, Sarah Isker, is joining Dr. Ritchie. Is that going to be another one of his big debates? I don't know. You don't know. You're going to have to tune in to find out. But it will be indisputably an entertaining time. So you're definitely not going to want to miss that. Uh, with that said, Dan, are you ready to jump into this thing? As ready as I'll ever be. Okay, let's do it. We're gonna start off with some rough stuff, and then it's gonna get rougher, and then it'll get briefly very cute, and then it'll get fun. So, check in on that. Stay tuned. Anyway, let's do this. <clears throat> Representative Ilhan Omar is calling out the band of Democrats that have, for some reason, called her out in public with their insane read of comments she made about American foreign policy. She's saying that they are harassing and silencing her after they issued a late night statement criticizing her for comparing war crimes committed by the US and Israel to Hamas and the Taliban. So we've got a lot on this, but let's start off with the comments that have led to the letter from these Democrats and what will probably be six weeks of Fox News commentary. Uh, I know you oppose the court's investigation in both um, Palestine and in Afghanistan. I haven't seen any evidence in either cases that domestic courts can uh, both can and will prosecute alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity. And I would emphasize that in Israel and Palestine, uh, this includes crimes committed by both the Israeli security forces and Hamas. In Afghanistan, it includes crimes committed by the Af Afghan national government and the Taliban. So in both of these cases, if domestic courts can't or won't pursue justice, and we oppose the ICC, where do we think the victims of these supposed uh, crimes can go for justice? In, in both of these cases, if domestic courts can't or won't pursue justice, and we oppose the ICC, where do we think victims are supposed to go for justice? And what justice mechanisms do you support for them? Dan, am I crazy? What, 
what is the controversy here? Crimes have been committed in these places by all the groups that she named. There's very good reason to fear that domestic courts won't be able to in an unbiased fashion investigate them. The ICC, and she's talking about some specific cases in the ICC, but I don't even think that she would need to be for this to be an acceptable comment. What what is the what's the what's the scandal? What what is going on here? I mean, the controversy directly is that Ilhan Omar is challenging the forces of power that keep our like military interests going. Essentially, like there's a certain correct agenda and a correct way to approach things and say things when you're talking about foreign policy, and it's to always prop up or never at least attack our um, allies in the Middle East. And so this like. You're right when you kind of set it up, John, that this is going to be the next six weeks of Fox News fodder because they are so far past talking about policy or any like real agenda that's happening in the United States domestically. They're going to move this foreign policy thing because they know that it can probably excite people who are in their base who are really just looking for anything relating to Joe Biden faltering. And there's this also tinge of being able to point things at Ilhan Omar and all of the racism, sexism, and Islamophobia that kind of comes surrounding that. So unfortunately, Definitely. it's gonna be a great punching bag. But it has to be acknowledged that what she is saying here is really rational. And it's just following the letter of international law that of course should be recognized. But you're kind of getting the tell bears that when international law is brought up in these circles, the response is, Oh, you don't really believe that, do you? This is this is this is American interests and American interests abroad and our allies abroad, and our friends abroad for um, our own reasons. So it's the laws don't even apply. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, look. There's oh my god. There's so many things I want to say about the response to it. The fact that, it, like, and and people in the chat are pointing this out. If the only part of this entire equation that matters is that it was Ilhan Omar. I think if virtually anyone else said what she said, it would be fine. Rashida Tlaib would get in trouble probably, maybe AOC, that's about it. If anyone else said exactly what she said, there would be no problem. Um, but let's run through a couple different aspects of this. So first of all, let's acknowledge some of the context historically. This dispute over her comments comes more than two years after she faced public pushback from both parties over comments seen as anti-Semitic. The House GOP raced today to turn the statement that came out from those dozen Democrats last night into a political weapon against the Congresswoman. With leaders likely to plot floor action on the chamber floor next week. But unlike in 2019, Omar's latest remarks have drawn no specific complaints of anti Semitism from fellow Democrats. And I don't know how they would, since she's talking about Israel, yes, and Hamas, their crimes, Taliban's crimes, the Afghan national government's crimes, the US's crimes. She is being quite equal in her condemnation of needless civilian suffering and death at the hands of all of these different groups. But the Democrats have now said, you know what GOP, you, you, want, you want to attack her? Let's make it seem as if it would be bipartisan, bipartisan to do that. And so they're gonna, they're gonna try to get her kicked out of her committees. They're gonna try to get her kicked out of Congress. I mean, never mind that like eight days ago, Marjorie Greene said that the vaccine thing was like being sent to the gas chambers in Auschwitz. They didn't have a problem with that. That was an anti-Semitic, but a criticism that's as equally condemning Hamas as Israel, that's gonna be seen because she's Ilhan Omar as anti-Semitic. And, and, and by the that, way, oh, sorry, continue. I was gonna say to that excellent point really fast that you've made about um, Comparing it to Marjorie Greene's things, there were some comments on the right where it's like, okay, this is kind of a little bit too far. We don't need to compare like masks to anti Semitic. Like, like, there were some people that was like that. So those thoughts were in the right wing discourse. But like you said, John, they have the ability to respond to that in any similar method that they are planning to respond or have responded already in Ilhan Omar in a similar fashion with a similar veracity. And they're not doing that because they don't like Democrats. They don't like brown women and they don't like anything Ilhan Omar is saying because she's speaking truth to power. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, this is, is this crazy? I know we're gonna talk about this later on, but does this kind of just feel like the critical race theory thing? Like, how dare you ever acknowledge that anyone we like has ever done anything wrong? I want to live, like Republicans will spend 10 straight minutes talking about how libs need safe spaces. And then they'll spend the next 10 minutes saying, how dare you ever acknowledge uncomfortable, inconvenient truths. Um, the US has committed atrocities and war crimes. And honestly, like the fault, they're saying it's a false equivalence to say that the US and Israel are in any way comparable 
in terms of the crimes they've done to Hamas and the Taliban. Uh, I think that they're right, but not in the way that they mean. They're saying, of course, that nothing Israel or the US has ever done could ever rise to the level of what Hamas has done. It's the exact opposite. The US has literally dropped nuclear weapons on cities. Like the idea that Hamas in their wildest fantasies could ever do a tiny fraction of the damage that the US has frequently done. Pick a country, honestly. Go to, go to Laos, go to Cambodia, go to Vietnam. You want to talk about war crimes and atrocities? You're really going to say that our past, our past is clean. We have nothing to fear, worry about. And having a representative who's willing to acknowledge that is a problem, except mainly it's that she is a woman. She's, as you pointed out, brown. She's a Muslim. She's a refugee. How dare she come here and ever criticize the country that she should be so grateful took her in? That is what I feel like is simmering, not even really in the background of this entire conversation. She's supposed to come here, be thankful that we helped her, shut up, don't try to get involved in politics, certainly don't criticize this country. I feel like that's the foundation for this whole conversation and a lot of latent racism on top of it. Yeah. My, my last point I'll just say is that you can tell, and the reason I get harp on bad faith actors so often, so all the time, is because you can tell when they are throwing uh, accusations of anti Semitism around. And then in the next segment, we'll say, people are complaining about racism way too much. It really doesn't exist. It's not a problem. Totally. Or it's, it's so clear when they want to use the same things they say are being weaponized by the left. They say the left puts racism and critical race theory out everywhere so that white people feel guilty all the time and they weaponize that. And they, put in their great replacement theory, racism, all that stuff. But then when it turns around and they get to play the anti-Semitism card, they don't stop. There's not a hint of irony as to what they're doing rhetorically there being the exact same thing. It's a bad faith yeah. argument if you can't see the difference. Exactly. Well, let's turn to the inevitable next section of this. Ilhan Omar now under fire from both some Democrats and every Republican in the country over incredibly rational, saying, I would argue, necessary for the growth of our country comments about American and Israeli war crimes, says that she's receiving death threats because of course she is. This is America after all. So we're gonna play a little bit of a voicemail that she posted on Twitter as an example of what we're seeing. They destroy cultural heritage, they destroy history, um, just like Miss Ilhan Omar. Because Muslims are terrorists and she is a raghead and every anti-American communist piece that works for her. Uh, I hope get what's coming for you. Okay, uh, so is, so I asked all of you, are, are you surprised by that? Are you surprised about, by that or any of the others? Dan, are you surprised what, that that's the comment she got? John, what about the context? Doesn't context matter there? <laughs> Please provide some context for me, Dan. No, like if, if you remove the bleeps, it's actually <laughs> much worse. You don't get that's, no, that's no. true. <laughs> we're no, we're no. protecting that guy. Yeah, no, it's it, unfortunately I, I kind of do think because there was a point where the Republican Party, George W. Bush even, was during the lead up to the war in Iraq trying to say, no, no, Muslims are not our enemies. Stop confusing Muslims and Sikh people. It's totally different like groups. Uh, let's try to like be friendly with our neighbors. Uh, I remember John McCain had to uh, swage or like calm down a woman on stage one time who was saying that Barack Obama can't be trusted because he's an Arab. And John McCain had to say, no, he's a decent family man and not an Arab. Let alone that was like a weird comment to make that those two are a dichotomy. But like you, we've gone from. Very recently, I mean, it's about ten or fifteen years now. But the Republican Party was looking like. Hey, we're obviously hitting the accelerator on Islamophobia through our foreign policy. But at least on a social level, let's try to carry the compassionate conservatism thing a little bit. But yeah. no, in 2021, it's completely thrown out the window now. And like, that's the mainstream of the Republican Party. Not because like a major pundit is going and making that like death threat call himself or herself, but because these people are repeating the same talking points. That's like, um, 
cultural destruction of values and Muslims a terrorist and like where where, where are either he where's either he hearing those things or is he constantly getting those fears abated and like massaged and like why is he constantly getting triggered by those things? And the answer is right wing media, because that is where it's moved to. And it's this is where you can see this is the edge of the result. As you can see where it happens right before it gets violent. And so um, our response to this needs to be uh, appropriate in that regard. Yep, 100%. Yeah, you can't tune into Fox News without hearing, you know, that BLM are terrorists and. You know, like we're gonna we're gonna have references like the the attempts to tie uh, you know Ilhan Omar and other members of the squad to Hamas directly. Like this, it's not subtle. It's the most bash you over the head uh, programming and propaganda, but it is there. Well, she had to say this about the death threats. This is incited directly by articles like this, which we'll show you, and far right politicians like this, and is enabled by a political culture in both parties that allows and often fuels Islamophobia. And she is right to say that it is both parties. I hate both sides of them. I've been very clear about that. But when it exists on both sides, you do have to acknowledge it. Um, And so take a look at Fox News. Ilhan Omar says America, like Hamas and the Taliban, has committed unthinkable atrocities. Well, look, we clearly have. I I don't understand if Hamas had, uh, let's say, drone struck a wedding and killed dozens of civilians, would that not be a war crime? Wait a second, it wasn't Hamas, it was us. I know you couldn't have seen that coming. So what is that not a, I guess, you know, okay, it's kind of uncomfortable to drone strike a wedding, but we make great sneakers. So I guess it's free, like you get one free, I suppose. You can nuke a couple cities and that's okay. You can commit a few genocides, but let's not talk about it. None of this is debatable in any way, which is why they don't debate it. They just shut it down. They're not saying we should have critical race theory domestically or for our international policy. And we should have something that focuses on the great humanitarian work we're doing. They're saying don't talk about it, don't teach it, don't learn about it. And whether it's a teacher teaching a kid or Ilhan Omar acknowledging historic realities in interviews like what you saw right there. Nope, just don't engage with it. This party that loves, they love a debate. Except in some cases, and they would really prefer if there was no talk of this. Yeah, it's so disgusting. Like, there's a Lauren Bober tweet that maybe you'll get to in a moment, but like, it's just the things that people are saying and further putting gasoline on this fire. It's, I mean, xenophobia is alive and well in America right now. And this is not to be alarmist or scaring, but these are like elected. Officials, regular people who are starting to gen up this hatred, and it only ends in violence. It only ends in violence. So, like, mm-hmm. it's only like it sucks to kind of be in this position where you see all of this calamity happening in slow motion, and you as an individual can't really do much about it because of what's ingrained in the country for so long. All you have to do is really just try your best to inform other people and say, hey, what if the shoe was on the other foot, right? Like, mm-hmm. how would we respond if we if so seeing drones that we're just kind of annoyed with for like surveillance reasons because we think our neighbor's snooping on us. We think, oh, that drone over there, that could be a rocket that could kill me and my family because it has like countless times before because this happens every couple of weeks over here. Um, that's what it's like to be on the other side of American foreign policy and what it has been for my entire life and definitely longer. So Ilhan Omar is attempting to reckon with that, other people should. And I hope that Democrats, I mean, if Democrats are truly progressive to also put Ilhan Omar in the hot seat because Ilhan Omar was saying that Joe Biden and um, the new kind of era of Democrats that are coming in right now would be a little bit more progressive. I expect more Democrats, not just from the squad, to show up and provide some color yeah. for Ilhan Omar here. Because what she's saying should not be controversial. What she's saying is firmly grounded within human rights. And it, it can't just constantly be these strong people taking the fire all the time for the truth. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, and there are a few that are defending her. Um, we also have, as you pointed out, uh, Lauren Boebert tweeted, Ilhan Omar, honorary member of Hamas. Just compared the US military with the Taliban. So she just compared a congresswoman serving US congresswoman with a terrorist. 
Yeah, she, no, she's literally saying but we like, have terrorist sympathizers in Congress and it's been yep. normalized by the mainstream media. So don't trust any media but ours or Fox News is the um, Newsmaxes because we're telling you the lies. And also, they're defending terrorist sympathizers. So you should see your antagonism against them as a life or death situation because they're coming for you. They're coming for you in a cultural way. And this is in 4K, the, the, the video and the screenshots are here. They're doing this live because they are priming their base for violence. And it just, mm -hmm. we have to call it out clearly. It's bleak and it's grim, but that's what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, never mind that compared the US military with Taliban and acknowledged Taliban atrocities. But she's leaving that part out. Yeah, you're 100% right. They're priming them for violence. I am amazed that we have gotten a couple of years in to the squad serving in Congress without one of them being the target of successful violence. Obviously, there has been attempted violence against them in multiple cases. They want Ilhan Omar to be assassinated. That is what they want. And when they do it, Tucker Carlson will give a monologue about how, how dare they imply that there was anything political about the assassin. It was just a random person. You should be so angry at them that they would smear white people with this. And that's, I, I just, God, I hope that I'm wrong. But that's the direction like Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity are gonna blink when the bodies start piling up. The natural outgrowth of their advocacy and people like Lauren Boebert as well. Okay, we do have to take our first break. When we come back, we've got good news sort of for the environment. Isn't that exciting? As well as really bad news when it comes to cops and some rough videos. But we're gonna get through it together. I'll see you after this. Okay, so let's see what's going on out there. First of all, in the super chat section, thank you to Mika for your looks like trumpeting lemon emoji. Appreciate that, no message, but still much appreciated. Uh, let's see, Steven says, can't watch live today because my boss is forcing us to attend a meeting, but refuses to pay us. I'm wearing Dragon Squad 2.0 as a symbol of resistance. I like that, yeah, I look, I used to, um, I worked in a number of different restaurants for a long time and we would have the, the mandatory meetings where you have to go into like try out wine or whatever so you can upsell later. And yeah, a lot of those are unpaid. Isn't it amazing how that works out? Daryl Robson says, can I claim rational Catholic dragon? You can and you're much needed, thank you for that. Ferret Queen says, casting to the TV and my month old kitten is watching you very intently. Can you please say hi to Watson? Watson, you're a good cat, thank you. Uh, Don O'Brien, uh, hey Don, Don was in the, the pre-show with a big super chat saying Ilhan Omar is us. Ilhan Omar is an American patriot. Ilhan Omar is every man. We are all one except for the Republicans. Yeah, well, no, Liz Cheney's pretty awesome though. Um, but anyway, uh, did wanna let you know, so we, we referenced the fact that she is being defended by uh, some Democrats, including like AOC saying pretty sick and tired of the constant vilification, intentional mischaracterization and public targeting of Ilhan coming from our caucus. They have no concept for the danger they put her in by skipping private conversations and leaping to fueling targeted news cycles around her. I agree with what she said, but even that is like sort of almost conceding that a private conversation is warranted. And I don't agree with that. They should just be defending her. We need people to understand what America is if we're going to improve it. And then like having a private conversation to get her to not say stuff like that in the future, that sucks. Anyway, really fast, there were two super chats I didn't get to yesterday that I wanna make sure I get to before I proceed with some of the more new ones, including um, Nov who said maybe he should ask her to go ahead and rotate the moon so we can look at that side for a while, referencing the insane Louis Gohmert video yesterday. Dan, did you see Louis Gohmert and his uh, moon orbit theory? Yeah, I, I do some recreational uh, activities in my time. And even I couldn't <laughs> follow anything that he was saying at all. Like that was some wild stuff. I'd love to try some. <laughs> That's awesome. By the way, I just saw in the YouTube chat that the cat apparently perked up when I said its name. Watson, Watson, watch out, it's a dog. Anyway, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, and finally, Free Spirit Dragon Mama had said yesterday, I miss you boys, been busy training my new crew because I offer a good living wage with benefits. And good on AOC for as always telling it like it is, follow the money and you learn their intentions. AOC 2024, that's referencing her calling out Joe Manchin and his donors. On the pre-show, we talked about the Chamber of Commerce earlier this year began giving money to Joe Manchin again. After not doing so since 2012, I wonder why all of a sudden they feel confident donating to him. And I wonder if he 
might do something as a result of those donations. Interesting. Anyway, over on Twitch, L Bell subscribed for the second month. Thank you to L Bell. I'm not sure, yep, no, it is here because I'd seen it earlier. Brandy Lou started off the show gifting five tier one subs, much appreciated. Octo Squiddies did as well. And it looks like it is Octo, Octo Squiddies also subscribed for the 12th month, says happy one year subversary on my birthday week. Octo Squiddies, happy birthday. Love your name. Daisy Dragon also gifted a tier one sub. Thank you for that. Let's see, uh, how much time do we have? 16 seconds, Social Work Dragon says that video you shared on Twitter where the cop rolled a car on the interstate made me sick. It did for me too, and unfortunately it's coming up in just a few seconds. So bear that in mind, but that said, more news. Okay, everyone, let's jump right back into this thing. <clears throat> The Keystone XL pipeline is dead. Long live the not having it, thankfully, because it probably would have ended up being a, a massive environmental and cultural disaster. It is actually dead though, is that amazing? Good news, good environmental news, Dan. The pipeline is not gonna happen. It was gonna be nearly 1200 miles long and would have carried 800,000 barrels a day of petroleum from Canada to the Gulf Coast. Now, after environmental activists spent literally years, much of it we covered here, making the case to President Barack Obama that approval of the pipeline would be a devastating blow to his efforts to fight climate change. Back in 2015, he announced that his administration would reject its construction permit. Now, that was there was wrinkles, obviously, with Donald Trump along the way. But earlier this year, on the day he was inaugurated, Mr. Biden who, and I included this so that we can have some discussion about it later, who has vowed to make tackling climate change a centerpiece of his administration, rescinded the construction permit for the pipeline, which developers had sought to build for over a decade. That same day, TC Energy, the company behind the project, said it was suspending work on the line. So we have some reactions to this, but really fast, Dan, it, let's acknowledge it is good that he, is, uh, that he has helped to finalize the death of this pipeline. It is interesting though to continue to talk about how fighting climate change is a centerpiece of his administration. I don't know that shutting down this pipeline necessarily um, warrants that as a continued description of the Biden administration. Yeah, I'll really fast the Biden administration. I'll definitely say that it feels like one of those things where it is a thing that Joe Biden can point to in the future when he does something that is less climate friendly, where he can say, hey, look, I did this one thing. So on balance, it's all right. I actually, come on, man, I actually have been good for climate justice. I'll shut down the Keystone pipeline. I stood out there with my boots myself that one time. I was there myself, Jack. Um, like he, he's, <laughs> he's gonna do this whole like bit where he's going to try to seem like he's tough on the climate on a couple of things, but if I'm making sort of an early judgment on Joe Biden right now, he's gonna be one of those politicians who um, is on, on climate, I hesitate to say this, but I think he's going to still be beholden to a lot of the major industries that have kept the Democratic Party from making more decisive uh, movement on climate uh, in the past 10 years since Al Gore was making documentaries about this. But really fast, I do wanna say that um, the Keystone XL pipeline like closing and being done is uh, thanks to the work of indigenous folks who are there basically yeah. defending their land. And these are people who, like, unfortunately, in our political system, we just so thoroughly underrepresent a lot of communities, but especially indigenous communities, when a lot of the um, machinations of our society, as we're like industrializing more heavily, directly result in poisoning their water supplies, the limited water supplies they already have, because they aren't getting any resources, because it's so hard for them to get representation. So this should be a really like, Great moment. I hope that gives um, hope to a lot of folks out there who may be like um, disillusioned with the power of movements and people mm -hmm. organizing together and being strong as possible. Because like, if some of the most marginalized people in American and Canadian society uh, can possibly like do make some effort to stand strong against major titans of industry like this, then there is some hope after there. And I'll, I'll get whatever hope I can from the damage report. Honestly, we don't tell yeah, any totally. great stories all the time. So for sure. That's why we're trying to focus on it. It's positive. And and yeah, yeah, it's uh it was it was years of work, difficult work. Uh we showed yesterday with the Alabama coal miner strike how activists are treated during these actions. So uh great work, a reminder that while progress is rare and slow this is the only way that you actually get it. And yeah, it's easy to become 
apathetic or disillusioned. I am disillusioned right now. Also, there's this weird backlash to organizing and activism that I've seen brewing online that seeks to elevate fairly explicitly. Like, no, it's politics is really about watching shows like the damage report and Twitter, which is great if that's how you make your money, but that's not actually how progress happens. It should be a motivation to get out there and actually do stuff. No, organizing, actually getting out there, getting candidates elected, pushing for the issues you care about, that's how you get it done. And so let's tie it to another issue that we've been talking about recently, which is, of course, Enbridge Line 3, another pipeline that's being protested right now. Um, activists are seeing the termination of Keystone XL as maybe a precedent that President Biden can be pushed on this. You have, uh, let's see, uh, Kendall Mackey, who's a campaign manager for 350.org, we've had representatives from 350 a few times, um, saying this victory puts polluters and their financiers on notice. Terminate your fossil fuel projects now or a relentless mass movement will stop them for you. And I really hope that that is true. I will say though, and, and this really goes to what Dan was saying about him being beholden of these interests. It, it is a little bit easier to sort of like, just hold the pillow down on Keystone XL for a couple more seconds when it was already there, than to creep into the room with the pillow. 100%. I don't know why I went with that metaphor, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna let that sit, let's move on. Anyway, um, okay, so I do wanna do a quick fact check though, because uh, Keystone XL is dead, but sometimes there is zombie misinformation around projects like this. So you're gonna get a bit of that with Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming who said, President Biden killed the Keystone XL pipeline and with it, thousands of good paying American jobs. On inauguration day, the president signed an executive order that ended pipeline construction and handed 1000 workers pink slips. Now 10 times that number of jobs will never be created. So on inauguration day, kill 1000 jobs, 10,000 more jobs would have been coming. All of this despite the fact that like it, it's been Fairly clear that the pipeline wasn't going to continue being constructed for years. I don't know why what, they just have the workers waiting in the wings. But anyway, uh, you'll be shocked to find out none of that's actually true. The State Department forecasted that no more than 50 jobs, some of which could be located in Canada, would be required to maintain the pipeline. And only 35 of them would be permanent, 15 would be temporary contractors. I believe years ago, I think we compared it to you know the average workforce of, say, an Arby's. Yes, Biden has killed one Arby's worth of pipeline maintenance workers. And that's sad, I like Arby's, um, but it's not thousands of jobs. That's not actually what happened. And when we think about the environmental damage that could have been done, let alone the fact that they crossed lands that they shouldn't be crossing and all that. Yeah, Biden did a good thing. It's not necessarily the hardest thing to have done, but it's a good thing. Okay, let's turn to a very different news. If you are squeamish about violence, you're gonna want to possibly tune out for just a minute or so. <clears throat> We're gonna show you footage of a cop using what is called a pit maneuver to attempt to stop the car of a pregnant woman that didn't pull over fast enough to satisfy the cops need to be obeyed. It gets worse fast. Nicole Harper was driving home on the I-67 and is alleged to have been clocked for speeding by Senior Corporal Rodney Dunn, who claims that she fled. But in the video, we see an obvious decrease in speed as Harper pulls into the right lane and activates her turn signal. She claims it was to indicate she was going to exit the interstate, as the area had a reduced shoulder, regardless of Harper's actions and indications that she would stop. Corporal Dunn initiates a pit maneuver. Okay, Dan, so I'm gonna let you go first. What are your thoughts about this? 
Yeah, I think one of the more chilling parts was at the end where he's his response to the situation is a uh, groan. Someone call EMS, the emergency like yep. services, because it looks like I've someone's like injured here, whatever. As though like I, I'm from Los Angeles, I've seen my fair share of high speed chases. These usually happen when the cars are refusing to slow down. Um, mm-hmm. you, that's when you do pit maneuvers. I've seen a bunch of them happen. A lot of them do end in rollovers or whatever. So many of them don't, but like that's happening when you have a high speed chase that has been on TV for like 45 minutes where yeah. the driver has done dangerous things. And it's like, we need to stop this driver even being on the road because they're causing a problem. Here, I don't know what the driver could possibly be doing better. Like as you see here, um, she's trying to indicate that she's exiting soon because that's often what you do. That shoulder there does not look like you can actually stay there and pull someone over. Yeah, if the cars were stopped there, then you'd be on a highway and cars would have to swoop around you as you're stopped. Like that's not night. safe to pull up at night. That's ridiculous. And um, SUVs, specifically, like. Well, I won't say specifically, but just SUVs in general are the most rollover prone. Just in yeah. like, I, I I don't know what. I'll say this, and I'll say what I actually think. One, I don't know what possibly possessed that officer to see that that maneuver was necessary at that time. It was an obscene, absolutely obscene abuse of force. But my response to that is. This is the same obscene abuse of force, a similar obscene abuse of force we've seen in police um, forces around the country, which is why calls to not just oh put some light reforms here and put some cameras there. No, yeah. fundamentally overhaul the way we do justice and you know protecting the community in this country because that's not protection. The stuff we've been talking about of police violence for the past year. In minimum, but honestly, entire time of American society maximum, that stuff is not just a reform you can put away. This is an issue yeah. with the entire system. Yeah. How do you again? Like, how do you? What what course are we gonna fund and mandate to make that guy not respond to something that's crazier, more dangerous, more reckless than literally anything I've done in my entire life? With it flipped over now, somebody call EMS. I've spilled a bit of coffee while entering the studio and been more freaked out about it than that guy was when he just flipped an SUV. At that point, he has no idea if he has splattered the inside of that SUV with the brains of one or more people. He has no idea. It was a pregnant woman in the car. Now, thankfully, she was okay as much as you can be when a cop has needlessly flipped your car. Because as we've pointed out millions of times over literally years, um, there's a lot of things that you can do to anger a cop, but there's nothing you can do like not submitting to his authority immediately and fully. You inconvenience a cop, and that is among the most dangerous things you can do in America. By the way, there's a lot of arguments, you know, potentially for not buying SUVs, you know, fuel mileage and all that. Maybe don't buy an SUV because there's cops out there. Wear your seatbelt because there's cops. Don't buy an SUV because there's cops and they might flip over your car at some point. Anyway, I want to give you details about the individual woman though. This is Nicole Harper. She has sued the Arkansas State Police and accused them of negligently performing the pit maneuver, which seems like a pretty open and shut case right there. She was going 84 in a 70 when he flashed his lights to pull her over. I like if we could take a live shot of the 405 right now, literally every single car is doing that. Most of them won't flip over, it's LA, so maybe some of them will flip over, but most of them won't end up flipping over. But he decided to elevate this to that. When he finally caught up to her, it's not on the video that we have right there, he, uh, the body mic caught his conversation. He asked her, why didn't you stop? And she said, because I didn't feel it was safe. And he said, well, this is where you ended up. No, he's take him out. He can never be a cop again. And you know what? A couple generations later, still, his kids, grandkids, don't let them be cops just to be safe. If it if the if the like stone dead icy tone of him realizing he flipped an SUV doesn't convince you, him berating the woman who he nearly killed should be enough. You don't need a judge, you don't need a jury, you don't need any sort of investigation. He can never be a cop again and give the woman whatever money she asked for. 
Oh, oh, but no, John, blue lives matter. Let's keep sociopaths on the force because that's what I want protecting and serving our community. Mm-hmm. That just makes the most sense. Blue that, yeah, God, these, I, I hate the thought that people would even go to defend, oh, there's something that she was doing wrong. Oh, she was driving so unsafely as though these same LARPers who love police officers so much have never sped in their Jeeps before. Just, it's so ridiculous. Yeah. Ugh. Like we we've watched a lot of really rough police videos in just the last two months or so, but not having any reaction, I don't understand how you can do that. How could you like if Dan, if you accidentally hit the back of someone's car and that was it, you'd freak out, right? What has yeah, this like- guy done in the past that made him a person who could not freak out in that case? The logical answer is that, like, yeah, being on the police force, you see a lot of gnarly things that numbs you a little bit. But I think you should still be able to find your empathy for other people, regardless of what job you're doing or how long you've done that job. And that's just so fundamentally devoid that he's going into like abusive relationship tactics, like, look what you made me did, look what you made me yeah. do, kind of stuff. That's absolutely, he's a garbage human being. Yeah, he, That's my he threw a woman down the stairs, went to the bottom of the stairs and said, where did that end? You, where did you end up with that, huh? That's that's what happened. <sighs> Insane. Okay, um, we've got we got more to come. We've got a little bit more good news that we unfortunately have Ben Shapiro. All that's coming up after this break. Okay, so Karen goes to Washington, which and the profile. If the what do you think the profile picture picture for Karen goes to Washington is? I hope it's a bit emoji. It's it's not unfortunately. It's uh it's Marjorie Green. But anyway, Karen goes to Washington says, "Great seeing Dan back on the show." Hey, Marjorie Green's a fan of yours. That's awesome. Well, she's one of many. Um, let's see. Joe says, didn't even do the pit correctly. You're supposed to hit in front of the rear wheel, poor training on show. I thought that he did hit the front of the rear wheel, but the technique isn't really what bothers me about this. It's the doing it. Like when a cop needlessly shoots someone, it's not his trigger discipline that bothers me. It's the shooting of the person, but I see what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Tim Brennan says, 28 years in law enforcement, over half on interstates. I never would have done that. Well, Tim Brennan, you're a you're a human, <laughs> so <laughs> you're not a monster, Tim Brennan, and I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, I can't, I, I don't. What what would you have to think was going on on in that car to try to flip it, or to do something that has the risk of flipping it? I don't know. Okay, let's see. Uh, J M says, "May I please claim Slippers Dragon? Love you all. You may. Very comfy name. Enjoy it." Okay, Jesslyn Jackson says, can we get trade one of the two red dragons for a rainbow dragon? See, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good point. Now that we have a choptyt.com, we have our rainbow pride dragon shirt. I think one of those emojis is gonna have to be flipped over to the pride dragon. Can we, I don't know if the graphics people are listening, but can we do that? That'd be pretty cool. Uh, Joe Clark says he should be fired and as for family in the UK, I'm pretty sure it would mean a family member could not join. I was joking about his kids not being able to join the police force someday. Unfortunately, I'll double down on that. I'll double down on that because, yeah. like, I, I mean, I, I think it's a non-serious point, but I'll make it serious. Do you hear a lot of stories about you know generations of you know my father was a cop, my father's father was a cop, and yeah. uh, it's still the same. We can tell that this is the same generation of people who have been taught the same things are okay, and we see it in other forms of power too, where like with. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, the way he acts is similar to the way his dad acts allegedly. Some things stay in the family and those things shouldn't be involved in policing the public. Yeah. Yeah, I never I never understand like like I remember I apologize, I can't remember the individual's name, but there was a guy, another victim of police brutality, who had he like turned left when he wasn't supposed to, or he'd committed some traffic violation. Basically murder. Him over. What's that? Basically murder. Yeah. And the and so the cop pulls him over, he gets out of the car and runs, and the cop shoots him in the back. He had committed a traffic violation. This woman was speeding. I don't understand how the solution to the problem is a thousand times more violent and that's acceptable. And we give endless protection to these cops. No, they have, with great power, 
does not come great protection from any consequences. That would not have made for an awesome story. But that's how it works out here, unfortunately. Okay, natural one dragons has fired this man, fire him yesterday and ever let him have any authority again. Another bad apple in the barrel, starting to seem like the barrel is spoiled. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe some people that like cops are like, well, no, it's just one time. Like you can't shut him down for one time. Okay, like I, I do this job. If at some point I like flipped Anna out of her chair and she flew and hit a wall, I'm done. I don't have to do it twice, okay? Sometimes once it's enough. Anna, I'm not gonna touch your chair, don't worry. Anyway, we got a lot more news, some fun stuff coming up. We'll see you after this. Okay, everyone, let's move into a little bit of good news in our continued coverage of Pride and what's going on in related issues in America. <clears throat> in America, same sex marriage has been legal now for a few years after decades of activism and assurances from the right that if that were to happen, that's it for America. Everything's gonna shut down, we're done. It's gonna be like the fall of Rome. These are things that they said. Uh, America's in a rough spot, but I don't think it can be traced back to the same sex marriage. And it looks like most people seem to agree because support for same sex marriage has been inching up steadily uh, for many years, actually. It's now at 70% overall. That's the highest uh, in Gallup's uh, tracking poll since 1996. The latest figure marks an increase of 10 percentage points since 2015 when it was ruled by SCOTUS that all states had to recognize. Same sex marriage. And you can see that overall support generally going up, although not always from year to year, dating back to 1997. So let's let's stop there for a second. In 1997, it was at less than 30% support. Now it's at about 70%. Dan, what do you think about this? I actually, um, th there's a soul underneath here sometimes, it does exist. Um, I actually had a <laughs> Interesting thought about that because like 97, a year 1997 at 30%, that's around the time I was born more or less, right? And so to see that number at seven, <laughs> amazing. Um, we were born in the same hospital essentially. Do you see that number at 70% in 2021, like in my lifetime, when I have like seen and experienced a lot of homophobia in my life and to like see that in not just like my lifetime, but like in my young lifetime, I'm now able to be like a young adult where like um, my bisexuality is not something that is like constantly attacked other than just by me being online, but that just comes to the territory. But like in more overall in society where I think it largely matters in like a legal context, um, that being part of the LGBTQ community like doesn't like afford the same sort of negative repercussions in society as it did even when I was like one or two. Like it's yeah. It's really like good news. It actually made me like kind of step back and pause for a moment. Like, wow, progress does happen sometimes, and like people can actually like truly materially benefit from it. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it's a good point. It it is steadily going up. I mean, you know, the the cynic in me also says, really, seventy percent like there are real issues, and like a third of the country is either opposed to it or isn't sure at this point. It's been legal for six years. It hasn't negatively affected you in any way because how would it? Like if you don't like it, don't get involved in it. I've gone my entire life, I've never had a same sex marriage. Like it's not gonna blindside you someday. You just realize, oh my God, am I walking down an aisle? That's not how it works, okay? You're gonna be okay. So 70%, it has also, by the way, we wanna break it down amongst political groups. And the Democrats, 83%. Although it had been that way several years ago and then sort of dipped down and dipped back up. I Ugh, I understand there's natural variation in polls over time, but I don't like that. Anyway, Republicans though, it has been going up. It had been fairly steady, even dropping. Remember around 05, well, you don't because you were six years old. Um, the uh, Under Bush, they made, that was like their big strategy to get voters out was renewed uh, attempts at the state level to basically do to uh, gay Americans what they're doing to trans Americans right now. And so it actually went down. But now in the wake of it being legalized, when it was at 40, it's now at 55%. And I have to assume part of that is uh, you know, maybe a little bit more representation, you know, like on TV and things like that. Like it's a little bit harder to hate things when you see it and it's just it's this exact same thing as your life. Um, but the other is, yeah, no, it didn't have any negative effect. 
Like you can still get married as a straight person. You can still get divorced as a straight person. Most people watching this will do both of those things. Um, yeah, I, I like to think that it's just, oh, it wasn't that bad. And to me, that's a sign that sometimes you, you just gotta do the thing and show people that it's not bad. Like some people are nervous about what, you know, like free college would be like. Well, what does that actually mean? You know, or switching over to Medicare for all. Do you really think people would hate either of those things five, six years after it? I kind of doubt that. Yeah, the, the last point is that you can see this when you look at polls of a lot of issues over time, especially more recently, that they become partisan. But once it's like a settled issue, like, um, Obviously, like the struggle continues and like the battles are truly never over. But like once things kind of reach their moment, like the um, Supreme Court uh, rulings that affirm same sex marriage in the United States, you kind of just see a general reversion that everything is trending upwards. Things still stay partisan, and that's kind of the issues when we handle partisan politics all the time. But at least you're seeing on all sides, there's some improvement because yeah, people are just living their lives and going, oh, my gay nephew or like my um, queer niece is like not really, a, okay. <laughs> it is not really affecting me. In fact, I still love them very much, so all good. Yeah, so my, my final question then will be, we're looking at this poll, we're seeing in Gallup steadily for the most part support amongst all political groups eventually for same sex marriage goes up. So. When or is this going to happen for transgender Americans? Because you know, 16 years ago was like the high water mark of Republicans apparently figuring out, okay, so we got our tax cuts, we've got our police state, we got nothing else. So we're gonna make this all about fighting against gay people. I think that they get, you know, they're seeing polls like this. They can't really do that. That's not that popular. But they appear to think, based on what we're seeing in states around the country, that it is open season on transgender Americans. You can do whatever you want, you can say whatever you want, you can make that the, I was gonna say main legislative focus of the party, but the main focus is stopping people from voting. Um, and now it's dueling with stopping critical race theory as the only other thing that Republicans do. So is in six years, are we gonna see numbers like this for, and I don't mean like, you know, some specific legal right, but just accepting that these are uh, Americans, that these are humans in the same way as everyone else, that they have the same inherent dignity as everyone else, that it should not be one of the main focuses of a political party to make their lives a living hell, especially when they're the children. Well, what's your level of hope for that in like the next five to 10 years? Uh, five to 10 years abysmally, because like what's been said, I think, maybe even by James Baldwin, I'll paraphrase it for TV 14, but like America needs an other, that there needs to be an other person to point mm -hmm. to, cynically speaking, unless there's something that can be pointed to that is more otherable to conservatives than trans folks. I think you're right, they're gonna be a like cudgel for a while. Um, it just is the means to say that's important for allies, other folks in the queer community who feel like, um, oh, we can just relax now, we've gotten rights, everything's all chill. Like no, the struggle continues to continue making sure that um, everyone is included when we say that like everyone has rights. So yeah. I, unfortunately, it's gonna take a while, but I think that should embolden um, allies and everyone else alike to um, like get ready for that battle and continue as the next part of it. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know what accelerates that process, assuming that it's going to happen. But well, legal it case, is honestly, <laughs> it's like anytime something comes up in front of the Supreme Court, we're like, it eventually leaves this era of like, oh, what will. Marjorie Green, or like, what will the Democrats pretend to do? Would give lip service to, but ultimately like watered down and like deprioritized because they want to do something else. Like, it's gonna yeah. ultimately take a Supreme Court case, but of course that is very bleak, essentially, um, because we know what the Supreme Court looks like. But you never know; That's it could true. like run right down the middle with someone's like real rights with something, and you could be surprised. Sometimes it happens, but. Yeah, it's really gonna have to transcend the, our regular politics for anything to move in either way. And I'm not comfortable with what way it would move considering the Supreme Court. I, I, I definitely agree about the Supreme Court. What I wonder though is um, like with, with gay Americans, it seemed like there really was sort of one core question. It's not the only question, obviously there are others, but whether you will be legally allowed to marry was such a centerpiece of the conversation nationally. It's not that there aren't legal questions 
or that are unfortunately being raised by Republicans when it comes to trans Americans, like being able to play in the sports that you want or being able to go into the bathroom you want. But I don't know, it, it just, it seems like it's more of a, can we attack this group without suffering any social, cultural, political consequences? And my fear is that it is, every, I mean, it is everywhere. It is so many states in just the last few months. This is what they've been focusing focusing on. And coming from the Democrats, feels like mostly the sound of silence. Like there's, they're not standing up in support of that community, which unfortunately reminds me of what happened with this. A lot of Democrats were just sort of like biding their time, like we'll see if the SCOTUS makes it legal, but I'm not gonna stick my neck out before then. And then a lot of them would later have to pretend to care about it, like Hillary Clinton eventually did, and Obama, and all that. Yeah, like that's literally what Obama was doing. Notably, Joe Biden made a gaffe about um, the administration being in favor of same-sex marriage, which forced Obama to then like officially yes. say it out publicly. Like, I mean, that's like weird. I guess we'll score one for Uncle Joe, broken clocks right twice a day. But like, <laughs> exactly, I, I don't think we can rely on like rainbow capitalism or like rainbow washing and these things to be the only sort of allyships that um, LGBTQ people can like rely on. It has to be Democrats who don't just opportunistically choose, Oh, well, we, we can't talk about these issues because all of our priorities are so important. I'm so tired of Democrats making excuses in different cases for inaction when it's like, listen, the news cycle is going to exist. You're going to be criticized for things that don't matter. So totally. start being criticized for things that do matter by doing actual things and by standing up and taking stands for things. It turns out people like when elected officials take stands. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I agree. Well, we only have a couple more minutes for a hard out, so let's jump into this last topic. I know it's going to be one that you're going to enjoy, Dan. <clears throat> ben Shapiro has thoughts about using the N word, and that's what we've all been waiting for. That's what 2021 needed. Here he is. I will say that when it comes to the use of the N word, there is a difference between calling a black person an N word with an ER at the end and in, in jest using the N word that ends with an A to describe a white person. Now, the latter is also really crude and gross and stupid. It's not racist in the same way that it would be if you were just shouting the N word at a, at a black person, which is the height of racism, obviously, in American society. But I, hey, I'm, that's your buddy. I'm that's so positive. I'm so positively glad you included that part of the quote because I have my non-serious approach and my serious approach. Uh, my non-serious approach is that uh, we are living in Boondocks episodes repeatedly, and that's all that's <laughs> happening. There's literally an episode in season two that was about a teacher who called one of the students the N-word, and they're making that argument. No, it's ah versus er, it's a whole different thing, <laughs> and it was based on a real event that happened in Kentucky in 2005. Like this is just conservative. Rush Limbaugh did a thing about this. This is another. <laughs> indication that like Ben Shapiro was supposed to be the gladiator that saves the GOP and like refreshes them with new young blood and like fresh perspectives. No, it's nope. just this crap. But the important point you have there is when he said uh, calling someone the N word and shouting that to them in the street. That's the height of racism in America. I mean, he truly believes that or like wants people to believe that that's his tell because when it comes to the rest of his show, he's attacking critical race theory because these People want you to believe that America is more racist than it really is, and shoving it down your throat. Or um, police brutality, when it's like uh, the statistics actually show that it happens more to white people. So these are people are complaining about nothing. Racism doesn't really exist. Um, anytime someone brings up racism because it happens a lot in society, Ben Shapiro is the first to say, well, actually, if you would know, A, rap music is garbage, and B, there's no such thing as racism, especially not for me. So, like, I, <laughs> that's that's been in a nutshell for you. It's not surprising, uh, but um, it, it was a great clip. That was some great content for Twitter, honestly. Shout out to Jason yeah. Campbell for continuing to break his brain watching uh, the Daily Wire network on a daily basis. So, here's that. That's true. That's true. And look, look, he says, you know, even the A version is still gross and crude, but not racist. Okay, yeah, it's so not racist that you'll notice. Hey Ben, why aren't you saying that version? If it's just gross, I can say gross things. Poop, for instance, I don't get in trouble for saying gross things. I wouldn't say a racist thing though, and you seem to have a similar rule on your show at least, I should say. So he tries to cover himself a little bit there. Although notably really fast, back in 2019 when Kyle Kashub, one of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas survivors, got in trouble for using the ER version over and over and over again. He had this tweet, which we're gonna put up very briefly, defending him, saying it's an insane cruel standard 
to expect him to have not used the ER version over and over and over again. Interesting. Anyway, for our linear audience, thank you for being here. We've got more coming up on Twitch and YouTube after this. Hello, Twitch, YouTube, thank you for still being here. Anyway, uh, we've got a lot more to talk about. We got some fun stuff coming up. Before that though, I did wanna let you know about something that we had uh, told you about a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's now moving towards the end, Aspiration Thursdays. So this is the final installment today of hashtag Aspiration Thursdays. This is a four week social media series of informative and engaging polls available. Uh, on the Young Turks, at the Young Turks on Instagram. This is our partnership with Aspiration, an ethical banking organization that we've talked about quite a bit. So uh, that is closing out today. Head to uh, the Young Turks Instagram so that you can take part in that. Also, I'm being told that there is a fun thing happening on the main show today with Jank and Anna. You guys definitely have to catch it live at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Time, uh, youtube.com slash the, uh, the Young Turks. I also have to because I have no idea what that's referring to. Fun might mean scary, we'll see what ends up happening. I don't know what it is, hopefully it'll be cool. So that's all coming up soon. Uh, really fast before we launch into the news, let me read a couple super chats. Franklin Sharp Slicer says in reference to the Chipotle story, uh, pay the employees up 4%, the CEO's finances didn't make a dent. Gee, how billionaires cry, they spend less for soft TP, my my. Please, sir, please, sir, may we have more? Would it scar you just a percentage more? So that's about how they're saying that Chipotle is having to raise their prices because they have to pay their employees more when their CEO makes $38 million. And they did this incredibly expensive move of their headquarters because the CEO wanted to live in a particular city. Weird that that didn't make it into the NBC News story. Anyway, and uh, let's see. Um, oh, Styx Dragon says uh, in the, I believe it was the Twitch comments. By the way, I asked a question in a super chat a few days ago that you never answered. If the masses let you pick a dragon name, what would it be? I don't know. Like, 
If it was truthful, I'd want it to be a successfully published fantasy author dragon, but that isn't possible yet. So we'll we'll return to that at some point and see what can happen. <laughs> anyway, and it looks like my reference to poop was clipped out on Twitch. Thanks, Twitch. Keep being you, Twitch. Anyway, uh, with that, let's get back into the news. <clears throat> and now it's time for news around from around the world in Meanwhile In. It's been a little bit since I've done that, can you tell? Anyway, meanwhile in Britain, raccoon dogs. That's the news. There are raccoon dogs in Britain and apparently it's a bit of a problem. It's an exotic member of the fox family um, that's native to Japan, China and Siberia, known there as a tanuki, by the way. Uh, they're one of the most destructive invasive species at risk of becoming established in Britain. They say at risk of becoming established. I say please become established because that is a raccoon dog. You know what else is? This is a raccoon dog. And also that is very much a raccoon dog right there. Aww. And you tell me it's an invasive species? Invade me, invade my state, invade my very home, raccoon dog. Look at that thing. Okay, are, are there some concerns? There are, and we'll turn to them in just one second. But Dan, if something has to invade your country, let it be that. Listen, I'm now for open borders because look at the cute Basura <laughs> boys. This is so nice right there. Um, just oh my god, this is so great. Um, I think there are a lot of interesting dogs out there, and I think like <laughs> breeding dog cultures become really controversial because some of these dogs are like really live unhealthy lives because of as a result of it. But like, I know there's problems. There's going to be problems because doing news means everything beautiful gets ruined at some point. But it, <laughs> it, they're so cute. Can we at least have them on an island or something? Yeah, well, you're right. Everything does get ruined uh, by the news, by Twitter. Uh, come up with a term, then release it out there. People will misuse it. But anyway, I'm going to ruin raccoon dogs for you a little bit. But first, the history. We're going to pretend that this is a Rachel Maddow monologue. Raccoon dogs were introduced into the old Soviet Union in the mid 20th century, including in Baltic states such as Latvia. Historically farmed for fur. Isn't that adorable? I wonder what they look like shaved. Raccoon dogs escaped and have spread rapidly through continental Europe in recent years, colonizing northern European countries such as Finland, Sweden, and Denmark, despite eradication efforts, which, geez, and being sighted in France, Germany, Poland, and the Netherlands. That is an amazing adventure that they have spread out all over the place. They've been kept in Britain as exotic pets, but since 2019, it's been illegal to buy or sell one. Uh, in the uh, Mammal Society, they have the best parties, is calling on people to report any sightings of the animals because apparently they pose a threat to rare native species, including amphibians, small mammals, and ground nesting birds. Also, they can transmit a number of diseases to humans, which obviously people are a little bit concerned about recently. But that said, they're really adorable. Honestly, eat the amphibians. How great were the ground nesting birds anyway? Get up in a tree, you stupid bird. We got rat and dogs coming in. It's organic pest control. Just keep it. <laughs> exactly. Just keep it. Meanwhile, in <music> Meanwhile, in China, they are apparently having, according to the numbers we've seen, a great amount of success with vaccination. For more than a week now, they've averaged about 20 million people being vaccinated against COVID-19 every single day. At this rate, that means that they would have fully vaccinated the entire population of the UK in less than one week. And because of that success, they now account for more than half of the 35 million people being vaccinated around the entire world every day. And we have a little chart actually where you can see that as world progress has been going up, a lot of it is being driven by Chinese vaccination. So, I mean, considering the number of people there and the fact that, you know, obviously they were very hard hit initially by it, great to see. Some countries doing well with vaccination, others not so much for reasons that are fairly obvious and we've talked about a lot. Yeah, for sure. We definitely talked about a lot of those reasons, largely having to do with the 
countries that are able to have the vaccines have such an abundance of vaccines that in America we have people who are openly turning down the vaccines for any number of reasons. I think someone who's part of African government somewhere said recently said that it is like, I'm paraphrasing, but it's just like ridiculous and insane that America's at the point where they're choosing to, Americans are choosing to refuse the vaccine. Meanwhile, there are countries that are at one or two percent levels of vaccinating their population. And this doesn't end. Americans can't do their happy go lucky travel around the world thing until other <laughs> places are able to slow their own spread. So it's actually in Americans' best interest to help, which is actually happening. I think we're going to be sending over, I think, a couple like hundred million doses across the world at least a certain point and um America bought them, we've got to deal with Pfizer. So it's like at a pretty decent rate at which we're buying them. So yeah. hopefully there are better signs of things to come. Thanks to pressure from the left on um, making sure that vaccines were um, spread equally across the world. So good for that. Exactly. Oh, we'll have those numbers for you in just one second. Just really fast though, I wanna let you know that China too is helping uh, vaccinate other countries. It, we, you know, When we were doing that pressure over the past few months to get Biden to do this. One of the things we were saying was other countries are doing this. Russia is sending vaccines to, to poor countries that don't have access to them. China is doing it and like a little bit, I'm sure they're doing it to help out. But a lot of it is vaccine diplomacy. They are endearing themselves to the population, understandably so since they're saving lives, we should do the same. They've supplied 350 million doses already to more than 75 nations. And WHO approval should now trigger the further distribution of both of the vaccines that they're using, which are different than the ones we are. One of them doesn't even seem all that amazing, the other one's okay. Um, they will be sending those out to low income countries. So 350 million already. Now, thanks to the pressure that Dan was talking about, the Biden administration announced earlier today that they're gonna be buying 500 million doses of Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine to donate to the world. The first 200 million will be distributed this year with the next 300 million in the first half of next year, which sounds fine. But like China's already done 350 million. You're, you're talking about over the next six months, we're gonna send 200 million. I mean, I guess it's better than not doing it, but you're gonna have a lot of suffering and death long before those doses ever make it to the countries that desperately need them. Yeah, I, yeah. hopefully. We hear, I only heard about like Pfizer from this information, but there are other companies that are making this vaccine that could hopefully contribute to the um, volume that's at least coming through there. So I, I really hope that we can ramp up and other um, countries are able to go through their approval processes so that we can get it out to as many people as quickly as possible. Yeah, and by the way, um, as a reminder of how necessary this is, India's health ministry data showed 6,148 deaths over a one 24 hour period. And I mentioned that mainly because I don't hear the media talking about India that much anymore. There was like a good week where we were all together and not wanting them to die and now kind of moved on. It might even be higher than that. One, one area is saying that they lost 9,400 people. The cases have gone down, it's less than 100,000. Although again, that's not actually reflective of how much COVID is in India right now. But yeah, China's doing some, some good work. We need to ramp it up too, because people are really suffering. And by the way, to those in the chat that are saying, hey, John, invasive species are actually really disruptive. I get it, <laughs> I'm just joking, because they're really cute. I get that invasive species are really bad. I mean, hell, look at what Americans do when they go into other countries. See, I'm gonna, am I gonna get attacked like Ilhan Omar? Probably not, mm, why is that? Anyway, uh, we've had a little bit of fun. Let's have a bit more, let's jump into this. <clears throat> Over the last day, we've learned more about Sherry Tenpenny. Now you might be saying, wait, who's Sherry Tenpenny and why should I care? Well, if that's the case, then you apparently missed her revealing as one of Ohio's vaccine experts the fact that the vaccine can make you magnetic and it, like magnetism, is now spreading. But first, I wanna give you just a brief bit of what we showed you yesterday. Here is Sherry Tenpenny. You've seen the pictures all over the internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. They can put a key on their forehead, it sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick. Okay, that's amazing. Anyway, you can watch our video from yesterday if you want her full comments, but that wasn't all that happened yesterday. She has backup, take a look at this. 
Either way, so I just found out something when I was on lunch, and I wanted to show it to you. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck, too. I got those. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? A few. <laughs> uh, um, can we explain why the key stuck to your chest? Oh, I don't know. You got sweaty chest flesh, I guess. Is that one possible explanation? I too sweat. If you prick me with a key, do I? does it not stick to me sometimes, Dan? She Shut kept up. going. No, continue. Thanks. Shout out to the Ohio channel playing the hits since 1996. <laughs> uh, <I> just, <laughs> that's just great. Like that's just wonderful television. I can't believe that's not pay per view. I'd watch that over Mayweather all any day. And uh, the best part is if you can pick. All I like to do during these things is pick a person in the video mm -hmm. in the back to look at their reaction. There's a woman in the top left hand corner who starts to gawk after she does the neck thing. And we'll start looking at my favorite. Yeah, she looks to the left there. Yep. I was gone yep. there, but she's just like, <laughs> what? And later on, she's just like, I cannot believe this is actually happening. Like, she's gonna, this is doing this. Wow. This is, uh, those are the most human moments to me because you have to acknowledge how insane that is. I mean, truly, that combined with the Louis Gomert clip from earlier this week, th those two are just mind boggling. <laughs> like, I don't even know where to begin. Bringing cogent political analysis to those statements, points of fact, only to say that this is where the constant um, naysaying and like anti-science propaganda that's been coming from the right wing, even though they're trying to make it seem like they are pro-science, um, this is what it leads to. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I do want to. Uh, give credit to the woman for sticking with the routine, despite the thing not sticking to her for the most part. Like she kept trying to stick it to her neck and it would fall off. Like, but but if it falls off, shouldn't you question the magnetic thing? I mean, shouldn't that cause you, like you say, any questions? But shouldn't you have questions? Shouldn't you question the fact that the vast majority of keys manufactured in America are not magnetic to begin with? They're not made of metals that are magnetic. That seems like the sort of, not all metals are magnetic. That's a pretty core scientific fact. Maybe look into that too. And then we're gonna have more on Sherry Tenpenny. Really fast question though. And and is this basically just Hey, we've opened up a door where people who regrettably, thanks to the fact that America doesn't really do anything about mental illness, that these are just people who have, you know, they have issues and they are being injected into politics. They're they're stuffed full of conspiracy theories and misinformation and people scare the hell out of them and then they send them out to events like this. Is that is that really just what we're seeing? I think there's How would you even know? Yeah, I think there's a distinction because in these cases, and I think people have to be careful during the Trump administration too, that there are also like people who are neurodivergent who go through like mental illness struggles and things like that too, and also don't believe bat crap crazy propaganda. That so is. like we have to allow for that possibility. But I think, and, and I appreciate you, John, for incorporating compassion to your commentary as much as you can. But like there is something to be said about how these people are sort of preyed upon and taken advantage of for being sort of like scared, constantly being fed um, propaganda to scare them. And then in this fragile moment, now they are believing these conspiracy theories. Now it's not like these conspiracy theories are because they have um, a uh, mental illness that might predispose them to thinking things that aren't there do exist. Because they're mm -hmm. people who go on TV to preach about things that don't exist that they say are actually there. So we can't go around diagnosing all these people. But I think That's it true. goes to say on like a personal, like on an on the ground level, like in the Ohio State House right there, I think it's true that a lot of the people on the right see 
these people as like docile and feeble minded and easy to take advantage of and get money from. That that's really just like when it comes down to the end of the day. That's why they charge five hundred dollars for their QAnon rallies. Because like whether you believe it or not, we're getting paid. That that's really what they believe in, and they'll. It, mm. There are real world ramifications to this thing, which is I think what we're starting to come at, at with. Because really fast, John, there's all those stories about um, people who have lost their parents and grandparents because they watch Fox News all the time. I don't think all of people's parents and grandparents are like, you know, people have mental illnesses here and there, but I think those might be there regardless. But to be preying on people who are in vulnerable situations, who are in information silos, especially when you're telling them not to trust any other media organizations but your own. Yeah, that does lead to a situation where it does feel very exploitative and you start to wonder or do they do Republican operatives know what they're doing? And I've seen Roger Stone talk before, so the answer is absolutely. That's true. Yeah, yeah, you're totally right. These people exist in these information silos. They we've created basically in social media knowledge deserts, vast areas, communities that are walled off from actually getting information. But you did talk there about money, which provides a great intro in our next section. Meanwhile, in Griff Nation, no, but we really do have that though. Uh, Sherry Tenpenny, oh no no no, sorry, we're we're gonna we're gonna pause on the last few graphics. This last thing, we might have to wait till tomorrow for the Marjorie stuff. But um, uh, you've probably seen the video going around of the supposed vaccine, the anti-vaccine expert Sherry Tenpenny, um, talking about people sticking forks and, and spoons to themselves because they're magnetic, which is totally not true. And you might wonder, why do this? Why? Humiliate yourself spreading complete misinformation and endangering the lives of people who need to be vaccinated. Well, what if I were to tell you there's some money in it? I don't even know if it's much money, but there's definitely some money. Because as was pointed out by Media Matters' Eric Hananoki, if you're curious about the grifting aspect of her claims, she sells things like live training for less than $200. She has premium podcast subscriptions for $240. Man, I didn't even know a podcast subscription could cost $240. That's a good amount of money. Eric also went onto her website and found things like this six week intensive boot camp for mastering vaccine info. They left off the miss by accident for $500. She also has, because of course, an online supplement store, probably selling the same mashed, like ground up gorilla brain that Alex Jones sells. That like gives you alpha wave energy and makes Bone you rock off. hard. <laughs> That's probably what's going on. But by the way, we're gonna comment on this. But I decided, well, no, uh, Eric, thank you for all that. But I gotta go to her website. I gotta see what else she has. And I found something that I should have predicted. Of course, she's gonna have Mike Lindell and my pillow. <laughs> she's you can order my pillow via Dr. Sherry Tenpenny because they're made with an exclusive silk microweave that keeps the vaccine out of your brain. It's basically just, it's an all you can eat grift buffet for you, Dan, what do you think? Order now with promo code institutionalized and get 15% off your first my pillow. <laughs> I, I, I actually no, I think the more like seeing the my pillow there was like the icing on the cake, but like like the cherry on top. But seeing the supplements is like, oh, we're going right into it. Like it's, oh yeah. well, you already don't trust the vaccines. Well, let me interest you in these supplements over here. Oh, you're already having uh, questions about the validity of these things. Well, let's just go over here for these uh, classes that I can offer you. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that yeah? I'm also with you. Two hundred fifty dollars is that monthly? Is that the annual subscription? Is that lifetime? Like, what's the rate on that? And uh, I don't know. Maybe TYT membership. We gotta adjust those numbers a little bit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I don't. Let, let's not. Um, but let's see about those pillows. They do look good. Anyway, yeah. Look, no, I understand. You know, uh, everybody's gotta survive. Uh, surviving by selling crappy stuff like this while you convince people to expose themselves to a fatal illness. Oh, that's among the worst grifts. You know, it's not as bad as someone like Tucker Carlson because he misinforms way more people, a hundred thousand times more people on a daily basis about vaccines than she could ever hope to. But this is basically what the world is. It has become easier to monetize literally anything you want than ever before. Go to Substack, you can see for yourself. Um, and regular people, 
they're the ones that lose out. They lose their money, they potentially lose their lives, they lose healthy relationships with their family because they've gone insane and eventually even their family members can't take it anymore. And that is what happens when you live in Griff Nation. Anyway, um, we've only got one more minute. I don't wanna make sure that we have time. Dan, you're occasionally on the show and we're always lucky when you are. But when you're not on the show, you still exist and you produce amazing content of your own. Where can people see that? Oh, I thank you, John. Uh, YouTube.com slash Dan from the internet for Power Report, my semi monthly political uh, talk show, interviewing really fun guests. Um, got a lot more cool ones coming up soon. And nice. um, fun videos also happen there. And just follow me on Twitter, Dan from the web, where I'm finding out which billionaire to potentially. <laughs> oh, wait, that's legally actionable. Um, never mind. Just follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphoric guillotines only, people. Okay. Minecraft guillotines. Exactly. Anyway, uh, thank you everybody for watching the new supersized uh, version of the show. Coming up right after this on YouTube, on Twitch, available to members, indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. It's gonna be amazing. People are loving this first week. Uh, become a part of the craze. Uh, you don't have to pay $250 a month. <laughs> you don't have to ingest, uh, ingest any uh, ground up raccoon dog. It's just, it's coming up right now where you're watching this. Uh, and for my part, thank you for being here. Until next time, stay safe out there, stay sane out there, and I'll see you soon.
What's happening? Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a big one today. Ladies and gentlemen, strap in for another hot one. We got a hot, I wish a Karen Wood segment. You won't believe this one. It is, well, let's just say it is what it is. Also, we got Joe Collins the third. Who was Joe Collins? Well, he's running for US Congress against Maxine Waters. Um, we know her affectionately as Auntie Maxine. He's gonna come on the show and debate me during the bullpen. You don't wanna miss that. We also have Sarah Isger. Sarah Isger is the uh, former Department of Justice spokeswoman. She would join me today. She served under the Trump administration. What are we gonna talk about? US Supreme Court packing the court or expanding the court and also maybe pro-choice versus pro-life. We may have that discussion as well. And none other than Francesca Fiorentini will be my co-host today on Indisputable. Let's kick it. We got Sarah, Sarah, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you. Let me first start off by asking you about some of the things you've said on Twitter or things you have retweeted as it relates to abortions in America. Do you believe that the argument is actually pro-life versus pro-choice or is it more complex than that? So I think those labels have become really unhelpful for folks. You know, Gallup actually had a poll they released yesterday and uh, the country is actually still about tied in terms of people who identify as pro-choice and pro-life. Also, the country is about tied in terms of people who think that abortion is morally wrong. And that's actually for the first time in the country uh, that that number has crept up for people who do not think it's morally wrong. It used to be that regardless of whether you were pro-choice that you still might think that abortion was morally wrong. So the country is shifting, but if you look at the last 30 plus years since Roe v. Wade, it has remained an incredibly contentious issue. So that's why I think those labels become really unhelpful because someone who is pro-life can still believe that some abortions should be legal or that it should be left up to the states, all sorts of things within the pro-life community. And same in the pro-choice community. You can absolutely be pro-choice and still believe that for instance, Partial birth abortions should be left up to the states and banned in some states. So I think when we're talking about the abortion conversation, we do a real disservice to the nuance of where people are. And you know, we're gonna get to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has a major abortion case coming up in the fall. And so I hope that as we in the media talk about this, we can talk about it with a little more nuance and a little less my team versus your team. Let's talk about that poll. That poll actually showed that 59% of Americans are actually for some level of abortion being allowable in the United States. And there's another side of that, which says you know, roughly 20 to 30% of Americans, they feel that it should not be. And then you have the extremists like Alabama passing a law that actually made it illegal if you are raped or if there's a case of incest made it illegal to seek an abortion. You literally would get more time for seeking an abortion from a rapist than the rapist would get in Alabama under that ridiculous statutory law. So it definitely requires nuance. Do you believe that policy connected to presidents actually impact abortion rates in America? Impact the rates of abortion? Uh, no, I think culture is always far more important than policy on so many questions that we talk about. Uh, you know, abortion rates have continued to go down in this country since at least the 90s, uh, which you know you can argue from both sides. The folks who want more restrictions on abortions can say, "Look, this is a victory for our side," and the folks who advocate for fewer restrictions say, "See, we need fewer restrictions. Birth control is more important. Providing support for." women who have an unintended pregnancy is important. Um, so I think that the who the president is matters for so many reasons. And it does matter for reproductive rights issues. There's a bill that's been brought up in the House, I believe every Congress for I don't know how long to basically codify Roe v. Wade into federal law. That's something where policy matters. But simply who the presidency is on whether an individual woman decides to seek an abortion, no, I guess I don't think that is probably that impactful. Well, let's talk about policy. I'm glad you did nod to the fact that yes, 
policy does matter from the presidency because policy does have a way of shaping the culture and atmosphere around us socially, economically, politically, educationally, etc. So let me read some stats because you're 50% right on abortions going down. But abortions in America have only gone down under certain policies. So let me read the stats to you. In Reagan from 19 81 to 1989, and this is taking rates per every 1,000 women, okay? In 1981 to 1989, you had your rate at 24. That was your abortion rate in America uh, per 1,000 women. H.W. Bush, 1989 to 1993, kept it the same at 24. It did not budge at all. Policies were the same. And then you had a massive policy change under Clinton. And it dropped to 16.2. W. Bush comes in, it stays at 16. It does not drop, it stays the same. And then President Obama comes in 2009 to 2017, and it drops to 12.5, almost half of what was under Reagan. So the only time you see a decline in actual abortion rates in America is when a Democrat is in the White House. Now, do you think that's a coincidence? Or if people are actually saying they're pro-life, they may need to start looking at voting for a Democrat if they're looking to decrease the number of abortions that actually happen in this country. I think that's so interesting. I hadn't seen those stats. You know, there well, let me tell you always- where to get them from. Hold on, wait a minute. I want to make sure yeah, you yeah. know where to get them from. The US Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention. The that's CDC. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's always that question between correlation and causation. I'd want to sit there and look at, you know, the Casey decision from the Supreme Court was decided in 1993 when Bill Clinton comes into office. Those are uh, correlated, they're not causal events. Uh, there were then some abortion decisions from the Supreme Court that would, in uh, both the Bush years and the Obama years, that would change what laws individual states could have. I'd be curious to chart all those numbers against those Supreme Court decisions. Maybe I can do that and come back next time. Yeah, you and, sure can. Uh, that's right. I can that's tell fine. you about do it. But, but I think that's come really back interesting. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah, come back anytime. Let me move to the Supreme Court. We'll only have a certain amount of time with you. Uh, so right now you have a set number of Supreme Court justices. The US Constitution does not mandate a particular number. Uh, that number has fluctuated uh, over the course of our American history. Uh, it has been as few as six uh, in 1969. Um, we've ha- we've had nine, 18, including 18, excuse me, 1869, nine, including the Chief Justice. Um, we've played with these numbers. Is my point. We have played with these numbers back and forth for for various reasons. For some reason, it seems as if people on the right are saying that now the number we have is the Holy Grail and it cannot be touched. What's your argument for that? You're a trained attorney. What's your argument for that? So the argument against adding seats to the court is that at this point it will become a never ending ratchet upward. So if Democrats add seats this time, Republicans will add seats next time and the court becomes another deeply political and partisan branch. I think there are plenty of people who can make good arguments that the court already is seen as pretty political and kind of partisan, but this would remove all doubt. Political and kind of partisan, come on now. I mean, the ship has sailed. We have a partisan court. We have a political court. And and this court has been politicized through the process of even getting nominated and appointed, right? Approved uh, through the process of politics. So we can't say it's kind of political. Come well, on. Now. I'm not sure I agree with that. The Supreme Court is still one of the most trusted institutions in government at this point. Plenty of oh, Americans that's saying do not absolutely see nothing. it. Wait a minute, Sarah, <laughs> compared, compared to the Senate and the House, that's saying yeah, zero. Well, when you have a what 12% approval rating of Congress, right. uh, it's hard to do worse. The the individual Supreme Court cases, I think that the mainstream media does a huge disservice when they talk about them because they usually talk about them in terms of partisanship. But for instance, today for at 10 a.m., the Supreme Court announced uh, an opinion on the Armed Career Career Criminal Act, and it was a 414 opinion. So it was Kagan writing for Breyer. Uh, and Sotomayor and Justice Gorsuch. 
Justice Thomas was the deciding vote, that fifth vote, that actually decided that the Armed Career Criminal Act did not apply to this person. And so that guy's gonna get out of jail because of it. And you won't hear a lot about that because it's not abortion, it's not affirmative action, and it wasn't five, four along partisan lines. So I wish we talked more about the court in terms of how the law works instead of how the politics works. So let's talk about that for a moment. I only have a couple of minutes with you. I find that quite interesting because the the US Senate actually votes in a bipartisan way more than not. The House votes in a bipartisan way more often than not every year. Every year there are more bills and resolutions that are bipartisan than anything else. But the reason why there's an emphasis on the things where there is a partisan split is because those items happen to be the massive social items that impact all of us. And that is why so much attention and emphasis is placed on that. So once again, the US Supreme Court, they agree. They agree on more cases than they disagree on. They agree, excuse me, on a large majority of the cases. But that's not to say that somehow it is not genuine if if there's an agreement and there's a disconnect with the community that somehow the US Supreme Court is not political because of that. I don't I don't get that argument. It it is still worthy to cover. Absolutely, but you're talking about unanimous Supreme Court decisions. I agree, there are lots of them, but the reason we talk about the five four ones is because those are the most contentious cases. And but the this most was impactful, a Sarah, would you not agree? I don't know that I agree that they're always the most impactful, but they sometimes are. Right. Um, but in this case, we're talking about a five four case where uh, two Republican appointees joined with the three Democratic appointees to make the 5-4. And that's not gonna get covered because it doesn't fit this narrative that we already have. That has happened multiple times. You wanna talk about a contentious case, Bostock from last set, um, term, where the Supreme Court held that sex applies to gender discrimination, uh, sexual orientation discrimination and gender identity discrimination. That was written by Justice Gorsuch, a Republican, a Trump appointee. Yeah. Uh, and those are the sort of things where it's like not the same as the Senate and yeah, House. You and don't Sarah, have Mitch I'm McConnell. Bring I'm, I'm gonna yeah. bring you back because I wanna talk more about some of those cases. Um, I'm glad that you do the research and you have a point of view. That's actually a good thing. I disagree with you on about 85% of some of the stuff you tweet. Um, I think some of the stuff you tweet is just downright silly. But I don't have enough time to get into all of that on this program. But we will bring you back and we will bring you back soon. Okay, Sarah, thank you for being on Indisputable. All right, we got more on the other side. I'm old enough that I remember when Captain Crunch put the berries in there. Yay, Crunch Berries! And I was like, ooh, the fake berries. Remember? We're gonna try that. We did a story <laughs> back in the day about how a woman sued, uh, I don't know, General Mills. <laughs> She'd been eating it for four years, right. believing that it was actual berries. Yeah, yeah, she's like, these aren't real berries at all. Yeah. I'm like, I got news for you, Captain Crunch isn't really a captain or a person. <laughs> <laughs> Joining me now, legendary whistleblower and American hero, Edward Snowden. First question is, hey, where are you? <laughs> I'm in my apartment in Moscow. <laughs> All of a sudden, in the studio, Jim Gaffigan, everybody. Mental illness is you know, completely undiagnosed in our society. It's not about a particular administration, it's about a broken system of power. And through that, really, the instrumentalization of a system of not justice, but injustice. People understand whether they claim to deny climate change or not. Our collective house is in crisis. We're also dealing with the legacy of 40 years of economic policies that have made people's lives more precarious. Sometimes you gotta force people into their humanity. Sometimes you have to shake people into empathy. Senator Elizabeth Warren joins us in the studio. Healthcare is a basic human right, and we are fighting for basic human rights. In order to actually achieve that vision of everyone having access to the same resources and getting to determine the outcome of their life, we have a lot of work to do, and it needs to start right now. Here's something you may not know. When you deposit your money in a big bank, it doesn't just sit safe and secure in a vault. Instead, your money could end up building oil pipelines, mining for coal, or drilling in the Arctic. So if you're concerned about the planet, give your money something good to do. Make the move to green with Aspiration's fossil fuel free account and join the thousands each week who are switching to save their dollars and save the planet at the same time. 
Welcome to the Damage Report, I'm John Iderola. This is gonna be a big one. What Donald Trump has done as president has cut taxes for the wealthy and made life better for rich people. But he's made life worse for poor people. We're making America great again by throwing more money at the military to destroy other countries because that makes us great instead of investing it in ourselves. That it's Donald Trump and it's Stephen Miller. The choosing is based on wanting to create cruel and inhumane conditions to scare other people away from ever coming to the United States. The opportunity to make money off of tragedy is the American way. There is only one place to put garbage people in the trash. We never had so much access to so much information with so little idea of what the hell is going on. What does enforcing our borders have to do with traumatizing children? Absolutely nothing. I think a sane person could say the current situation we have right now is radical. But what we're doing is literally making the world more like hell. That's a warning sign. ShopTYT.com now has books. One of them is Ryan Grimm's book, We've Got People. That's a saying that AOC said, they've got money, we've got people. It's the best tracing of the AOC victory I've seen anywhere. It's the most accurate and it's got great details. The book actually goes all the way back to Jesse Jackson and how he's the original Bernie Sanders. If you want to know how we're going to win going forward, those lessons are super important and they're in Ryan's book. So check it out right now at ShopTYT.com. We found the perfect person to lead the army, Allison Hartz. The establishment media works hand in glove with our corporate legislators and our corporate legislators work hand in glove with the corporation. And we're going to make it so that it's a decentralized force throughout the country so that we can quickly identify stories, quickly identify troll farms and go in and neutralize the enemy and then start building responsible media throughout the country and on every platform available. Welcome back to Indisputable. Let me read some of these viewer comments. Okay, we got a lot of them. I can't get to all of them. I would try to get to as many as possible. Bloodthirsty Pacifist says, do you understand in the slightest that this is not your decision to make unless it's your body? I mean, do you watch The Handmaid's Tale and take notes? I, you must believe that you would be a Serena Joy, but never once considered that you would likely be a handmaid. And you're apparently okay with that. All right, cool, good point. Chris Nesbitt, uh, thank you in the super chat. Hello, Dr. Richard, love the show, never stop. We won't ever stop, we. Uh, Micah, super chat, Dr. Rich is undefeatable. Agreed, Atlanta sister, super chat, loving the show, this is great stuff. Well, we appreciate that, thank you. Uh, you too, Vitingale, there's not a pro-abortion movement. The pro-choice side doesn't promote abortions. It only leaves the decision up to the person whose body will be the gestation vessel. Yeah, anti-choice takes that away, that's correct. Very good point. Crumble 104, the doc speaks truth, thank you. Uh, Cassandra Kaepernicki or Kaepernicka, Kaepernicka, I think I got that right, I hope so. Okay, uh, love this doctor, I love you back. And thank you for the hearts and the thumbs up, that's a nice touch. Uh, Jorge of PDX, I just want to ask Dr. Rich if he was ever a pastor or reverend, because every time I watch this show, I want to yell, testify and amen, or praise the Lord uh, uh, to the Twitch activity. Uh, BC Trumpet is gifting five tier one subs to TYT's community, uh, gifted a total of 60 on the on the channel, thank you. Um, Fiddle Nero says partial birth, birth abortion fiction, and a lot more, uh, pro-choice versus anti-choice, yeah. Um, you can tell me Jess said that, thank you. And we got a lot more, we'll get to uh, more coming up. But ladies and gentlemen, the reason why you're probably here in the first place is not for me, but for uh, my co-host who I will introduce in just a moment, <laughs> in just a moment. Uh, there's something I need to bring your attention to. I wanna be so rich one day, let me just say this out loud. I wanna be so rich one day, I don't have to pay taxes. Cuz it seems as if that's the formula. It's not about being rich 
in order to sustain yourself or take care of your family. Obviously, if you get enough money, I never knew this game until I learned it in America. If you get enough money, if you hook and crook and do whatever you have to do and you just get paid. And I'm not talking about regular paid, I'm talking about hella paid. The American government would just say, you know what, you good. You don't have to pay us a damn thing, you're fine. Ladies and gentlemen, that is basically what has happened with the revelation of Publica's investigation. They released a bunch of tax documents and some other documents that showed that the richest people in the United States of America, they are not paying federal taxes. Now, let me go a little deeper than just that investigation. Because while it is insane to believe that the richest people in the world do not pay federal taxes, the richest companies in the world do not pay their fair share in taxes. But look at what's called an expectation tax that everyone has to pay. When you go out and you go shopping, you pay the same taxes that a wealthy person pays. So let's say a family makes twelve dollars to $15,000 annually, right? That's all they make. And they pay for necessities. They buy food, they pay for transportation, they have to take care of home. Well, these things have taxes and they are taxed at the same rate as a wealthy person buying those same products, engaging in that same commerce. And to add insult to injury, they are also paying more actual taxes to the federal and state government than these very wealthy rich people who don't have to pay those taxes. It is an insane system. To talk more about this, we have my big sis, Francesca Fiorentini, host, <laughs> and I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it. The bituation room. Yeah. <laughs> you said it, Dr. Richie. It's so good to be here with you. And thanks for, yes, yeah, shouting out on my podcast, The Bituation Room. Um, this is the story of the week, right? The story of billionaires completely evading taxes. Um, and, and the ways that, of course, we're gonna see a lot of comments and you already see them about how, how that is legalized um, and how it is completely somehow um, they're able to do that within our current financial system because when you have a certain amount of wealth, you literally just borrow using that wealth and then you never ever ever have to pay taxes because so this is the thing that I like has been boggling my mind is like, okay, we know they've got the best, you know, tax attorneys and lawyers. There's that. They're gonna evade all kinds of things. We know that they're they've got all their stock increases, right? And their wealth increases. But really separating income and wealth from one another. And they're not really earning, their wealth is just growing, right? Their wealth is just constantly growing. And then okay, well how do they get money? ProPublica really explains that they borrow endlessly because they have all that stock that's accumulating wealth. They're just gonna borrow, so it's like a giant credit card, right? It's like, you know, <laughs> I think it was Carl Icahn, right, a billionaire, like his his revolving tax credit, like his line of credit, excuse me. Um, I believe, I forgot which bank, but with one of the banks was $10 billion. You guys, what if your t line of credit was $10 billion? You could do anything, and so this is the thing is that even when they, they use that money, they borrow money, you know this, Dr. Richie, they buy their own stock back to just artificially further inflate again part of their wealth that they're never gonna pay taxes on. I mean, it's amazing. I but just think about think about the the hypocrisy. I remember when President Obama was candidate Obama. Mm -hmm. And they looked at how much money he had given. They looked at how much money he paid in taxes. And they used it as a patriotic test. And they said things like, "Oh, wait a minute, he doesn't really pay a lot of money in taxes. Right. Well, he wasn't wealthy. I mean, he was, he had more money than most, but he wasn't wealthy like these cats, right? Mm -hmm. And then they talked about, well, he didn't contribute a significant amount of money. They also hit Joe Biden with the same thing. 
uh, Joe Biden was considered to be one of the poorest members of the US Senate, right? And they said, okay, these individuals are not patriotic because they're not paying a bunch of money to the American government or they're not volunteering funds when they could volunteer funds to the American government. Because yes, your taxation allows you to say, hey, I wanna give more money to the IRS. And by the way, if you know anyone who checks yes to that, slap them for me, okay? <laughs> All right, so the, here's the thing, President Trump runs. He runs, candidate Trump runs for president. He tells people, "Oh hell no, I don't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes me smart. Yep. Uh, I try to get out of paying taxes. And he is celebrated as the master patriot in the United States by that particular group. Help me, help me understand that. <laughs> well, that's exactly that. It's the it's it's and this is what I, I, I've been thinking about is the amount of class warfare and propaganda mm. that it takes to uphold a tax system like this that is so unjust for most Americans. Because like you're saying, the people who voted for Trump, who laud Trump for evading taxes, they look in the mirror and they're like, "Oh, tomorrow I'ma be Trump. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, buddy, I'm so sorry to break this to you. But most of us are not gonna be billionaires and we're not gonna be Trump and, and, and bless us for that. But like, we are not going to see this wealth in our lifetimes. So what do we do? How can we create a fairer system given that we're probably not gonna strike it rich and we're probably not gonna invent you know, the Tesla tomorrow or whatever. Like, um, And so not that any of that is deserving, but that's the other thing is we've been fed a line that billionaires deserve their wealth, that millionaires deserve their wealth, and that they create jobs and that they are bless them because man, you know, anything that trickles down from their little, you know, off their table, all the little crumbs, we just num 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 on it. Those crumbs aren't even enough. And those yeah. crumbs rely heavily on the American the American taxpayer, not billionaires, to subsidize what they are not paying their workers. Fifteen dollar hour an mm -hmm. hour twenty should be twenty three dollars an hour twenty five dollars an hour at this point. Um, Walmart telling its its workers to actually rely on welfare, right? They're like, oh yeah, no, if you can't make ends meet with our salaries, just you know you know apply for welfare. That's great. Yeah, yeah, quite insane. Um, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, said the story showed the rich have money, the rich have power, the rich have lobbyists. And the rich do not pay their fair share of taxes. Uh, this is a policy issue. Let me go to this video that gives some of just the insanity associated with the fact that these individuals do not have to pay taxes. All right, Jesse, big picture, this is no big surprise, right? We've long suspected, heard anecdotally, that the rich might not be paying their fair share in taxes. But we have never really seen specifics like this. Uh, you're reporting that Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, paid zero federal income taxes twice. Elon Musk, the second richest, didn't pay a penny in federal income taxes in 2018. Michael Bloomberg, George Soros, they have all paid no federal income taxes in years past, all legally though. So could you tell us first uh, about about the data you analyze here to get that information. Sure, I think that you know people are cynical about taxes and the wealthy, but I don't think that people really understood that you could be a multi-billionaire and actually pay zero recently. Elon Musk in 2018, zero federal taxes. So we obtained a vast trove of IRS data. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so we knew that they weren't paying what they should pay. We knew that. Everybody talked about it. It was part of the media narrative. Donald Trump, he confirmed it, but we didn't know exactly what the number was. So the big secret is the fact that the number is zero. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the number. Like how in the hell do you make so much money that the American government will basically allow you to bypass the regular taxation laws? Oh. It's written for you to bypass those taxation laws. It is in the code because people who wrote those laws work for people like you. I get it now. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of a bit that comedian Eddie Izzard had about like how mass murderers and like people who commit genocide are kind of like, well, congratulations. Like, but if, if it's like one murder, you're like, this is terrible. You're an awful person. But like, you know, okay, hat tip to Stalin. And you know, there's like, there's like a lot of like, 
you know, people people respect the amount of money. Like when you have this amount of money, people are like, hmm, maybe you're doing something right. Obviously, both billionaires and mass murderers have a little bit more in common, um, and we shouldn't laud them. I think my favorite part about this, which has been breaking my brain since the story actually came out, was the fact that okay, so the highest tax rate in America is 37% for couples with who make a combined $628,000. That's a lot of money, right? That's like you're doing really well if you make that amount of money. Like I'd be very happy if I ever saw that money in my lifetime. Um but those folks are paying 37% of that income. Meanwhile, billionaires who are making 10, 20 times that or more, don't do my math, are not paying anything and yet that is the middle and upper middle class that are constantly sold on the idea that poor people and working people don't deserve social programs, that they're coming for theirs, that they're gonna, you know, steal their jet skis and they're gonna take away their, you know, second homes and they don't want them to have nice things. And it's like, no, 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 no. You have way more in common with those workers than you do with the billionaires who are not paying the taxes that you're paying, buddy. And that is, you know, and this is the whole myth about Donald Trump and populism. These fools who voted for him, they're not working class folks. They are people who have wealth. They're the people who've been duped by all kinds of media from Fox News to NBC to mainstream outlets to you know moderate candidates like Pete Buttigieg or Michael Bloomberg or whomever into thinking that they have to demonize the working class if they are to keep their money. And that's not true. We have to work together to demonize the billionaires. I'm doing a lot of hand motions here. <laughs> I'm doing a, I'm voguing, I'm voguing with income inequality, Dr. Ritchie. That's um, great. But that's who we have to take aim at. But it's so brilliant when you pit actual like well off people against the poor. It's like, wow, they really, they know how to do this class warfare thing. And they've been doing it for a very long time. We gotta go to a break, but before we go to the break, I wanna say this and everyone who's viewing, I want you to remember something. This game has been played to pit Black people, brown people, and white people against each other. The truth is, we actually have more to fight against collectively as it relates to what they're doing to us. Let me give you an example. Dr. King, when he was assassinated, he had just started wrapping up the Poor People's Campaign. And he was connected to individuals in the labor force. This spanned across racial spectrums. We were now adopting a message that said clearly, we do not like how this system treats working class Americans. Mm -hmm. That brought people together. White nobles in the past wanted to teach an ideology that white was supreme. And that ideology did stick with many whites in this country. And if you can preach that and indoctrinate people to that false reality, they will believe that even when they vote against their own self interest, at least they're not black, or at least they're not brown. Mm. They're voting against their own self interest to stand with their white colleague, even though their white colleague doesn't give a damn about them, nor their work, period. Mm. Okay, all right, shifting gears. Um, have you just been waiting? For has been heaven. <laughs> okay, I actually thought this was like one of those satire things when I saw it the first time. I said, okay, this is not actually happening, right? Uh, but it is actually happening. It looks like former President Donald Trump and um, has been colleague Bill O'Reilly will engage in a three city history tour to discuss. The presidency and views on political issues. The tour will feature stops in Florida, Texas, two stops in each state in December, and will serve as a forum for Trump's for Trump to frame his political legacy while prepping for a potential comeback. Okay, so here's the thing: this is all in anticipation for Trump to run for president again. So understand exactly what it is, and they're going to get paid a bunch of money because Trump supporters are the most gullible contributors on the planet. Okay. They're going to get a lot of money and get paid doing this ridiculous tour. But damn, Bill, 
Bill O'Reilly is doing this tour with Donald Trump. Can I remind people of some things that let's say Bill O'Reilly has said, do we got some video on Bill O'Reilly? The reason Trayvon Martin died was because he looked a certain way and it wasn't based on skin color. If Trayvon Martin had been wearing a jacket like you are and a tie like you are, Mr. West, this evening, I don't think George Zimmerman would have any problem with him. But he was wearing a hoodie and he looked a certain way. And that way is how gangsters look. And therefore, he got attention. And the reason that that culture has risen is because there are a lot of gangs and they're violent and they dress a certain way. And when people see that, they associate that kind of bad conduct. So Martin was innocent of anything. He didn't do anything wrong, Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. But because he looked a certain way, he lost his life. And it's all interconnected to this violent crime that, as you stated and I stated, is, is driven by the dissolution of the family and no supervision and nobody really caring about what happens in those precincts. (laughs) <laughs> that was the day he actually should have been kicked off the air. That was the day that sponsors should have universally withdrawn support from Bill O'Reilly's show. What Bill O'Reilly just said was the equivalent of him blaming a rape victim for getting raped. Oh, you mm-hmm. should not have worn that outfit. No, you should not have been walking down the street by yourself. No, you should not have worn that wig or had that kind of purse. He's blaming the victim. And in his entire commentary, the one person he left out is the man who committed murder. He has absolutely no blame whatsoever for the man that committed murder. And in the same logic in his perverted ass mind, in that same commentary, he actually agrees that Trayvon Martin did nothing wrong. He agrees with that conclusion, but gives complete defense to the white man who did. They're going on a tour, him and Trump. Oh man, I I, I immediately looked up Space Cowboys. You remember that movie with like uh, Clint Eastwood and like uh, Tommy Lee Jones? I don't know why, but I was like, this is like Space Cowboys. And I wish that Bill O'Reilly and Donald Trump were just going with Bezos into space. And like I've been saying, don't come back, just go, leave us. Um, But I love, like, what do you think the mean age is going to be in the audience? Just like it's going, like, just like I'm saying, like 85, 87, maybe. This is like the last tour. This is like, oh my God, grandma's vaccinated. Let's get her out. You know, we, she can watch, you know, her boy Billy. Um, <laughs> speaking of Billy, I'm thinking about the tour bus too. I do not want to be on that tour bus when those two boomers swap <laughs> rope stories. Yeah, right? I, I can, I can imagine it smelling like, like old cabbage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, just Here. old cabbage and 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 sexual assault. That's exactly what <laughs> right. it is mixed together. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, here's what Trump had to say about the tour. Our army manned the airport. It ran the ramparts. It took over the airports. It did everything it had to do. We've ended the war on beautiful, clean coal, and it's just been announced that a second brand new coal mine where they're going to take out clean coal, meaning they're taking out coal, they're gonna clean it, is opening. This is an island surrounded by water, big water, ocean water. If you have a windmill anywhere near your house, congratulations, your house just went down 75% in value. And they say the noise causes cancer. You tell me that one, okay? (laughs) You know, the thing makes it so... Brand new F-35s, fighter jets. They're stealth, you can't see them. I said, how good are these? They said, well, sir, the problem is you can't see them when you fight them. I said, that sounds like it's a big advantage. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or or almost a cleaning because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that so that you're gonna have to use medical doctors with, but it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. That guy was our president. Now, now here's the thing. 
Um, I have already planned of what I'm going to tell my grandchildren. When they ask me after reviewing whatever they review on the internet about this man, when they ask me, how do you all elect him president of the United States? I am going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you what you're referring to. I don't know this man. Uh, you're just gonna gaslight your grandkids. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Here's what here's how Trump describes uh, the tour. Uh, these will be wonderful but hard hitting sessions where we'll talk about the real problems happening in the U.S. Those that the fake do. Hey, I ain't gonna read this bull. Okay, that's it. Let's get rid of the graphic. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yada, 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 right? It's the same talking points, but now he's actually, because Bill O'Reilly needs the money, right? And he has at least enough credibility left with some of those individuals that will actually come out, risk their lives and you know, get fed bull, he's gonna do it. And it's going to be interesting. Um, I hope I get, uh, I'm gonna get popcorn and just watch the highlights from it. No, yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm glad that you played the entire highlight reel of Trump's dumbest moments because I think we should watch that every every month, just remind ourselves, you know, it's like smelling salts. And you're like, all right, all right, things could be worse, but we still have to get keep fighting, keep fighting, stop the fascism. Um, it's hard to imagine a comeback tour with the most has been people who should have never left the 80s, like 89, like as soon as, you know, the 90s rolled around, both Bill O'Reilly and Donald Trump should have been catapulted into the memory hole. So I'm curious, you know, like, is this riling up the Republican base? I don't think so. Like, even on some like finding your new superstars thing, you don't go around with Bill O'Reilly. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like you gotta find like your your young new. I don't know who did you just have on the show? <laughs> <laughs> right. Sarah what was her name? Is uh, <laughs> yeah, she's not the one though. No, uh, but but this is interesting because you're right. Uh, Donald Trump has chosen Bill O'Reilly to be his wingman. Oh God, the groupies too. The groupies will all be in their 80s and they'll be like, no, we want the young hot ones. It's like, sir, no, but these are the ones who are waiting outside of the the, the van, you know, like, and fine, fine. Like that is, and you know, again. <laughs> they're gonna come with the shirts with the arrow that says, grab me here, right? They're gonna do all of that ridiculous stuff that was done during the first campaign. Okay, we got more on the other side. I'm Dr. Rashad Richard, this is indisputable. I'll predict right here for you, Chris. I think Donald Trump will leave office before his term is up. He'll be humiliated, embarrassed, and I know him. He's not gonna wanna That's, lose, and he's gonna run for the You got hills. that bet all day long. Okay, let's get after it. Now, um, so look, Jake has made some good <laughs> predictions, and you know, this is most, this is in good fun. I could not disagree more. There's um, a little bromance between the two of them. You got that bet all day long, Janky you. <laughs> oh, oh, you know you stop. In the meantime, <laughs> let's call him out on the day. No, but I I just got a Roku set. Uh did basically a little bit of channel surfing and I was like, there we are. Yeah. There we are. And then I turned it on and it was John and Brett on damage report making fun of me. Oh no. <laughs> So you are so busted. I even took a picture of it, okay? They're talking about my predictions. I got a new prediction for you, John Idola. You're doing a show that's blowing the doors off everybody. Young Turks is the largest online news network, not a big deal. We're gonna rock the boat. We're gonna be counter establishment. We're gonna tell people the truth to the best of our abilities. We're so sick of this corruption. We're not the robots on TV. I actually care about the news. Guilty, guilty, I care. Fourth day on Occupy Wall Street. Last night we launched Wolf Pack. It's us pushing our ideas out there, trying to help the country in every way that we can, trying to make this place just a little bit better. Reporting from the Hillary Bernie debate, I gotta be honest, you know what we do, we cover it for real. For us, this system isn't working. Free, free, free. and fair, and fair. Election. And when he told the cops that day, when they came to drag her away, and he said, if you're gonna chain her, you're gonna chain me. If you're gonna arrest her, you're gonna arrest me.
Hi, I'm Bartholomew Joseph Kyle. I do audio for the main show, The Young Turks. I also do audio for Post Game. I started in 2006. I met Cenk Uger at the Iraq for Sale screening that was directed by uh, Robert Greenwald. And watching that, I want to figure out a way to be part of something that's genuine and authentic. Welcome back to Indisputable. Let me read some of these viewer comments. Okay, and don't forget, don't forget, if you're watching me uh, through the damage report, my big homie, got nothing but love for him, but I won't be there, not forever. I need you to jump over to Indisputable TYT and subscribe to that YouTube channel now, okay? Make sure you do that because one day, you will be there thinking you're going to see indisputable after TDR and I would not be there. But there's a remedy and it's quick and it's fast and it takes literally 30 seconds. So go ahead and subscribe there, hit that bell so you can be alerted when indisputable is live. Let me read some of these comments. Electic miscellanea, Dr. Richie, you're too modest. Yeah, I'm actually not, but, but thank you for saying that. Dr. Richie, you're too modest. <laughs> A lot of us are here for you. Your first episode on Monday won me over. We need someone with your fire to take on the corporate establishment and school conservatives who desperately need it. Thank you. Someone who likes Bernie Sanders said, there is no institution that engages with power that is apolitical. Mm. Cray Cray Souffle, I sure hope when those two are on their <laughs> Neanderthal tour, great one. Both are wearing matching shirts that say, I'm with stupider. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the Knicks Dragon says in uh, Super Chat, oh my God, Franny Eddie is my number one comedian. Dr. Woo. Richie, I still want you to be our AG when you can. <laughs> I trust you. I wish someone like you was in office. Well, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Jacob, his voice, make it stop talking about Trump. Um, Costa Kyriakopoulos, Kyriakopoulos. Ooh, I think I did it. Yeah. yeah, because all 17 year olds should wear suits when they walk around their neighborhood, you know, like white kids do. <laughs> A lot of sarcasm. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. yeah. Telsa Ranger says, Dr. Rashad Ritchie and Francesca. Yes, awesomeness overload. That's beautiful. Ooh. Uh, Lucy says, I'm agnostic, but Dr. Ritchie is taking people to church. And now I am here for it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Lorian <laughs> Richardson says, indisputable is what America needs. Love this show and I love you back and thank you for that great compliment. Um, so many, so many. Uh, Mama Misa says, or Mama Heisa, I don't know. Um, Rashad gives me energy, it's like he fuels my fire. Careful. Okay. Come on, baby, fuel my <laughs> fire. Uh, emotional on, allergies baby. said, We, I love Dr. Reggie and his show so much. So happy this is a staple now. And thank you all so much. Wish I could read every single one of them. Unable to do so, but thank you, everybody, for the support. Okay, this is my segment. I wish a Karen would. <laughs> Yesterday, I brought you Dr. Karen. Dr. Karen was in Ohio and the Ohio Dr. Karen said that she's heard that if you actually get the vaccine, it makes you magnetized. So basically she was saying that getting the vaccine makes you magneto. And she was as serious as could be. Now what I peeped is how many people behind her had a straight face as if this woman knew what she was talking about. Well, they went to break this session where they're being asked these questions. Uh, <laughs> they went to break and, and remember, you're in front of Ohio lawmakers, right? This is them talking about the vaccine. A registered nurse, a registered nurse came up 
to address these Ohio lawmakers. And she is my Karen of the day. Her name is Joanna Overholt. She came back and I really don't need to explain this. I want you to see it for yourself. Yes, vaccines do harm people. By the way, so I just found out something when I was on lunch and I wanted to show it to you. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck too. I got this. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? I have a question. <gasps> Listen, is the magnetic strip on the back of this university ID card is what it is. Okay, <laughs> so here's what's really interesting about this Karen. Um, she's a registered nurse, first of all. Someone needs to review her license immediately, oh, okay? God. But I want to bring your attention to something. Because I've been in this position before, I'm not going to lie. All right, anytime Ben Carson opens his mouth, I'm like, damn, that's a loss for the black community. So I've been here before. There's a white female behind Nurse Karen. And she is obviously embarrassed for the entire white race. Now remember what this woman has already had to go through. The white female behind Nurse Karen has already experienced Dr. Karen. And it was embarrassing to hear Dr. Karen say you will turn into a magnet if you take a COVID vaccine. She weathered that storm. And then back from the break, here comes Nurse Karen. And can I just play the video again? I want you to look at the white female behind Nurse Karen and her reaction to the failed attempt to show that she's a magnet. Yes, vaccines do harm people. By the way, so I just found out something when I was on lunch and I wanted to show it to you. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck too. I got this. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? <laughs> the, the yes, face at the end. I mean, any questions? And then there was a brother behind all of them like, what this white woman doing? And and at least people, you see that, look at the brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, um, once again, the entire reason why this narrative exists about a vaccination, because remember, it doesn't exist about the thousands of, uh, of vaccinations that exist in the United States, right? It only exists about this one. Why? Because it was politicized through uh, the former president of the United States. Yes, absolutely. No, I mean, this. I just want to see her in med school, like you know, like so. Um, when you put like um my hair clip and my bobby pin on the cadaver, like what does that mean? And you're just like, oh god, oh god, oh god, don't ask the question, stop it. And then she got her license, and then she became a nurse, you know, like that. She's just a practicing nurse. That's very sad, um, and very scary, and also hilarious that it just falls off of her neck and she can't get it to stick. I think. What I have taken away from watching this clip is, and maybe she had tuition free college, maybe she did go to school, but we just, tuition free college guys, it's all about schooling. Can we please, can we please pass this? Can we please make it easier for people to get better access to information? Somebody help me. I don't, I literally am like, my brain is in knots trying to think about how this woman can, thinks that she is like onto something and that she is a nurse at the same time. I don't know. I, yeah. I really don't know, but it is an incredible amount of entitlement. And I, I look, people don't like some people, white people, 
Uh, I am I am white, uh, part white, <laughs> and I feel embarrassed for her so hard. But I also know that it's pure entitlement that allows you to get up in front of lawmakers and make claims and then try and stick metal to your body. Like, in what world do you? You just look in the mirror and you have like a cape behind you and you're just like an incredible like human being who's righteous and knows everything and <sighs> like that <laughs> amount of entitlement and privilege I think is very dangerous clearly. Yeah, and this woman made it through a scientific program. Yeah. Being a nurse requires scientific training. She's an RN. I know a lot of RNs. I have members of my family who are registered nurse nurses. Um, for this woman to make it through a nursing program and still think that a key is sticking to her chest because she's a magnet tells me she graduated because of her privilege, damn it. There's no <laughs> there's no other explanation to her graduation whatsoever from that kind of program. All right, let me shift gears uh, because this was disturbing, a very disturbing video that shows an Arkansas motorist, Nicole Harper. She's not even running away from the police. Basically, a police officer gets behind her. She's going fast. She got a lead foot. She's pregnant. She puts on her blinker. And then she puts on her hazard lights, which is another indication, hey, I'm going to pull over. But the place on the highway was really, really thin, right? And she didn't feel safe pulling over there. So she continued to drive so that she could get to a place where it opened up more. Well, obviously this state trooper, and thank God she is suing them now. This state trooper just got tired of just following this individual. Remember, there has been no um, report of any type of violence. This individual does not have any warrants connected to the license tag. There is no reason to do what this cop is about to do to this pregnant woman. The pit maneuver sent Harper's vehicle into the concrete center divider and overturned it. The manner in which Corporal Dunn casually strolls up to the vehicle seems to demonstrate he had no fear that the victim he had just offended was a threat in any way. Yeah, no threat whatsoever. Uh, the woman was a pregnant female. She was not trying to avoid pulling over. She put her blinker on first and then she put a hazard on, indicating that she is actually going to stop. She was waiting for the right opportunity because that part of the highway was very thin and not an appropriate place to pull over. We, we're running out of time, um, but Francesca, I gotta get your opinion on what you just saw. I mean, it's horrifying. I know that people in the chat and everywhere are just rightfully horrified. And this is why we need police out of, of traffic control and, 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 and traffic stops, right? They are have lost the responsibility. How many deaths, how many needless deaths, of course, as if there would ever be a reason to have a, a death in the issue of a traffic stop. How many people have been killed because of police in a, in a routine traffic stop pulling their guns, nine times out of 10 African American, of course. Um, and, and this is just an example, take them out of this job. They should be unarmed, they should not be you know uh, predators on the road. How dare you claim that you are trying to make a a street safer by stopping people from speeding and then flip a vehicle and then straight up run and ram your car into someone. I mean, we need them out of this entire law enforcement altogether. Yeah, it's a damn shame. Uh, initially, 
Uh, the state police did support the actions of this officer. Uh, we're going to see what happens with this lawsuit because things can get revealed in a lawsuit that did not get revealed initially. Um, I appreciate you so much, sister, for being on the show today. Don't forget to watch the Bituation Room Sundays at 5 p.m. on YouTube Yay. and Twitch. How can people follow you on social media? Follow me at Franny Fio on Instagram and Twitter and on YouTube. Thank you so much, Dr. Richie. Congrats on the show. What a great week. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, don't forget on the other side. We have the bullpen. Joe Collins, the third Republican candidate for Congress, is stepping into the ring with me. You don't want to miss it. Indisputable. Are you our next stream star? Oh my God, that's me? Show us what you got with your Twitch pitch. Ah! All you need to do is put together a two minute audition video on why you should have your own stream on TYT. And then put it on Twitter and use the hashtag Twitch pitch plus tag us at The Young Turks. And if you need even more information than that, tyt.com slash Twitch pitch has all the info you need. I can't wait to see your videos. All right, welcome to Dr. Rashad Richard Indisputable. This is going to be quite interesting. I don't know if you can handle this much truth on any day of the week. The unrest inside of the black community and communities that support them is because these cops are not held accountable. You have a family calling 911 and that family is expecting help, not expecting their loved one to be killed by the very people they pay to protect and serve them. Did you ever uh, notice a cop that you worked with call any black person the N word or target people because they were black? Nope. But we disagree <laughs> that somehow police officers are not also Maybe subject you to the be. same systemic Maybe. biases Maybe. and racism as any Maybe. other Maybe. level of law enforcement. It sounds like for everybody's need who wants to crucify the cops without looking at it. No, and I'm crucify I'm, bad I'm, cops, brother. Of bad course cops. Feels. We don't need the government to step into our lives mandating that we should be wearing a mask. You, uh, think you putting on the mask tray is government intrusion. But you don't think the government telling a woman what she can or cannot do with her body. It, it isn't government intrusion. Where does life begin? You want to go there? I can read it to you, bro. You seem very well prepared. Certainly more. Of course, why would I not be well prepared? They don't stop. I don't stop. Racism won't stop. I won't stop. Systemic bias won't stop. I won't stop. People still need health care, so I won't stop. People still need criminal justice systems reform throughout this country, so I won't stop. And you won't stop either. I've been a fan of TYT, I believe, for the last six years. Five years. Three years now. Seven years. Four years now. Two and a half years. I just started because she got me into it. <laughs> My boyfriend actually watches it every morning and every night, so I kind of just started watching it with him. and. I love it. I mean, it's the only way that I find my news. Looking through YouTube, looking for like, um, you know, political shows that look cool. I came across a very angry uh, rant from Jenk, and that's when, that's when I knew. So I was immediately in love with the show, and then I had like had to miss a live show since then. <laughs> Ten times a day, I watched the show in the morning. Whenever I had a bad day at high school, Young Turks. Man, Jenk is just so blunt and honest, and I love the honesty. And there's no BS behind the news, and they just tell everything. Like it is. There's nobody censoring them. There's nobody there to say you can't do this, you can't say that. The feel of authenticity makes it seem like what they're saying is true. I feel like I get the real story from the Young Turks. I am TYT. 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 Breaking news with Brett Ehrlich. This is Brett Ehrlich with breaking news with Brett Ehrlich. Bernie Sanders wants to break Wall Street and he wants to break it real bad. Our system is inherently rigged against the will of the people. They have 50% of the vote and in a democracy, they should have 50% of the seats. But if you live in an insanely gerrymandered district, your vote functionally doesn't matter. We drew the map in a way that even though we get 50% of the vote, we're gonna get 13 out of the 18 seats. You don't actually have the ability to translate the will of the voters in your area into actual government policy. They should not be allowed to gerrymander these districts. We should actually have a democracy.
Welcome back to Indisputable. Let me read some of these amazing viewer comments. Uh, Natasha says in the super chat, 100 plus nurses in Houston were just suspended for refusing the vaccine, mostly because it hasn't been fully approved by the FDA, plus having to sign waivers. Okay. Um, looking for some new ones. Uh, Auntie Faye says, Indisputable is my favorite TYT show already. Thank you for the great content, Dr. Richie. Well, thank you, Auntie Faye. Red Jed I66 says, I'm shocked she is a nurse. Are you really though? Are you really shocked she's a nurse? I mean, these people come in all professions, shapes, and sizes. Come on now. All right. <laughs> she is actively trying not to catch the dumb flying off this lady. <laughs> Talking about the white female that was in the back of the Karen that we just saw, who said that keys should stick to her skin, and in her demonstration, it did not. Um, great, great observation. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. I don't know why the brother came back. He had an opportunity to stay where he was at, but he came back. <laughs> I have Joe Collins the third Republican candidate running against Congresswoman Maxine Ward is affectionately known as Auntie Maxine. Uh, Joe, I appreciate you being on Indisputable. Uh, thank you for having me uh, once again. I, I look forward to having another conversation with you after the last one. I thought it was great. Yeah, well, it was a good conversation, man. I will appreciate you being here. Uh, let's start with police reform. Uh, 94 to 96% of Americans are actually for police reform. Roughly 58% yeah. of Americans say police reform must be dramatic. Even 51% of Republicans say some police reform needs to happen. I'm not talking about uh, criminal justice reform or um, some other type of justice reform, just police only. They're saying that there's something wrong with the police, right? What are your thoughts about police reform and why is it that uh, Republicans in your party have been so adversarial to police reform. Um, we'll, we'll start with the first part of that question. Um, I think that we do need police reform. Uh, being a 13 year US Navy veteran, we did training on a regular basis. And it was it was a quarterly training. Every four months when something new would come around or we have some incident that we, you know, the whole entire the US Navy fleet and the military in itself would do training. I think that same concept needs to be brought across the, the police force. I think mental health right now in the United States is a really big issue. And you know our police are not trained on how to identify uh, people with mental health issues. So I think that training needs to be implemented. Uh, another thing I think that needs to be happening is we need to have police that are actually from the communities, uh, police in those communities. A lot of times, especially here in Los Angeles, we have uh, law enforcement that are from other states, that are from other cities, and they have no idea about the the culture in the cities that they're policing in. And, and oftentimes they uh, think everybody are criminals. And so those are a few aspects that I think um, should be changed and, and a few things I think needs to be implemented. As far as the reason the party doesn't feel like um, you know, police reform is, is normal, is needed. I can't speak for everybody, but I can say that a lot of people, they, they fail to step foot in, in urban America or even identify with the issues that goes on in urban America. Uh, I made a distinction between um, Congresswoman Young Kim, the way she was able to get the Asian hate bill passed and the, the distinction between the uh, legislators that we have that's supposed to represent the black community. Now, a lot of people did not uh, like the um, the Asian hate bill, a lot of people thought it was unnecessary, but the fact of the matter is the Asian community thought it was necessary and they got that passed. Now, if it's gonna do something or not is besides the point. The fact of the matter is they got that bill passed and I think that same type of action and leadership needs to be uh, brought across the entire legislative perspective. Joe, I gotta say, brother, you just talked a whole lot and didn't say much of anything. So <laughs> okay. let, let me let me back, cuz you're doing a politician thing, okay? And And here's the politician thing, and I don't want you to get caught up in that. Because I think you are a decent individual and I think you believe in, in change, even if we disagree on the methodology. You're in a position inside of the Republican Party to do a couple of things. One, to ask questions that other Republicans are unwilling to ask because they're afraid of Trumpites, they're afraid of QAnon, I don't know, man. They're scared of everybody inside of the party, okay? You have the ability to say, here's what the problem is 
with Mitch McConnell. Here's what the problem is with whatever Republican you wanna call out. Now, let me give you some background on me. I don't give a damn who you are, Democrat, Republican, independent. If the issue does not align with a community I love, you will have a problem with me. Now, you're a military guy, Mm -hmm. a military guy like yourself, you understand protocol. You understand also what happens when there's adversity that comes against your team. You're part of some teams already, Joe. You're part of the black team, you're part of the black male team. Now you're part of a team of individuals running to transform policy. At some point, you have to stand up to your own party and tell them the truth about themselves. The truth is they have no business being adversarial to the George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act. Would you not agree? Uh, You know, yeah, absolutely. But here's the thing, You you can't force anybody to have a perspective that they've never seen before. So if you ask me my opinion on why they fail to get police reform done, I can tell you just like the last time is because they fail to understand the perspective from people who live in our community. They don't identify with people who live in our community. Therefore, the issues that we feel exist, they don't feel exist. That's why I brought up the whole bill about Young Kim getting the Asian hate pass. A lot of people didn't agree with it. A lot of people thought that Asian hate is not a big deal. The Asian community loved it and they thought it was an issue. So they got that bill passed. I think the same thing needs to happen within our community for our community. We have to pressure our politicians to get these bills passed. Joe, come on, man. Now you're saying the reason why uh, your fellow Republicans are not for police reform and the reason they stand against common sense legislation like the George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act is because they have not had the shared experiences. Wait a minute, a lot of these cats aren't multi-billionaires either. But they vote consistently to protect those billionaires. So explain that to me. I can't explain that to you. But what I can say is in the Republican Party, we got a lot of black talking faces that think that they speak for the entire black community and they have never shared the experience. Well, who are they? Name some of them. I I can tell you, you have Brandon Tatum. He's one of the biggest persons who I go back and forth with all the time. You have Candace Owens. You have people like this who speak about the black community who have never shared that experience. And so these are the people who are driving narratives that says that, you know what, we don't have any issues in the black community. We need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and stuff. Well, how can you pull yourself up by your bootstrap if you have no shoes? You I, know, I, so if you have never I'm shared that experience, that. then you cannot speak on that experience. And that's yeah. one of the biggest problems that I have within my party today. That's but me, the disconnect. I, I'm about Joe, police reform. Joe, that's the disconnect. They don't need to have the shared experience in order to create or support policy that helps the community or helps this nation. They don't have to know what it's like to be poor in order to help poor people. They don't have to know what it's like to be black in order to help black people. They don't have to know what it's like to be a woman in order to support legislation that helps women. Brother, you can't say that in order for politicians to actually do right and create good policy, and policy is a contract between the community and the and the government. You can't say they must have a shared experience because if that's the case, every politician who has not experienced whatever they're voting on would not be justified in that vote. You and can't that's the, say that's the way they should govern. Well, when you have politicians that are 20, 30, 40 years disconnected from the community, that's the issues that we have right now. That's the reason why we can't get anything passed. People think that there isn't a problem because they don't see a problem. They have never experienced a problem. So until they experience a problem, they will always keep that same mindset. Yeah, so but Joe, the time that we have, you're gonna have to have that shared experience. Joe, the reason why we can't get anything done in the Senate is because of dumbass Republicans who are anti stuff that you support. And you're going to have to be part of that new voice that says you guys are the ones being unreasonable. You just told me on my show, you support legislation that was created by a Democrat, co-sponsored by Democrats, supported by Democrats, and universally opposed by Republicans. Now, I looked at your Twitter feed, Joe. Mm -hmm. On your Twitter feed, you're going after Vice President Kamala Harris. You tweeted trying to get the WHO to investigate China. It's like trying to get Kamala Harris to go to the US-Mexico border. It's not going to happen. Taking a jab at her Lester Holt interview. Um, and, and I do agree, the way she answered the question was just horrible. But once again, proximity does not equal policy, okay? If you're able to sit on Twitter, and I got a bunch of them, man. Don't, don't make me read them all. If you're able to sit on Twitter all day, 
And you can talk about every Democrat, you can talk about every policy, every Democratic policy. But you say nothing about some of these individuals in that party, not only hijacking the message that you say they're hijacking, but being adversarial to the progress of the community that you support. Why don't you call them out the same way you call out Democrats? I'm, I'm the type of person that is looking forward to working together on a bipartisanship level, whether they do or whether they don't. And that's my position. So when I when I look at different bills, one of the biggest issues that I have is that we have politicians that don't work together. For me, I'm about getting younger politicians in office. That's why we've been traveling across the country with Angela Stedden King, with Marsh Teray, with Riza Islam actively engaging people in the inner cities to get actively involved in politics because we need a change, whether it's Republican or Democrats. We have politicians that sit in there too long. It seems like everybody right now is fighting for the superior opinion that means absolutely nothing. So we have to start getting people in office that are willing to work together, that want to work together, that want to improve the quality of life for people who live in our communities, regardless if they agree with the opinions or not. Okay. So I'm with you on that. I'm glad you all are going to urban communities. I'm glad you are trying to make sure more individuals in those communities are politically involved. But here's the real question. What policies are you telling them to support? Because if you want to actually attract the hood, I'm from Glenwood Road, all right, born and raised. If you want to attract the hood, you have to give them something to believe in. What are you giving them to believe in? You can't sell them Trump, you can't sell them that. You can't sell them the policies that Mitch McConnell produces. You can't sell them the policies of the right, not the traditional right. So what are you selling the hood or urban communities in order to get them more involved in what you're trying to do? Well, what we sell, well, we don't sell anything, but what we talk about is getting actively involved, whether it's on a local level or a federal level. But for what reason, brother? What's the policy behind it? What are you what are you telling these individuals you would do for them if they get engaged in politics? What can change for them? What policy issue is at the center of that discussion? Oh, I can't do anything for anybody but fight for them. It's gonna take people getting actively involved and helping us fight together. But what are you fighting for, changes. brother? What yeah, we're, we're, fight, on, we're fighting to improve our community. There is no policy. To In what way? Trump Trump had the $500 billion plan that would have gave us an economic advantage. You got to be freaking kidding But we don't me, have Joe. that anymore. We have Joe Biden Joe, that's given $10 billion, dollars, allegedly $10 billion. So when Joe, you talk about what policies that are gonna improve our communities, if we're not talking about specifically you know, just like uh, Joe Biden signed an executive order for LGBTQ, just like he signed an executive order for the Asian community. Where is ours? He said, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Every single black person felt like they had something to prove, so they voted for Joe Biden. Now look, okay. what do we have? What do we have from Joe Biden? Absolutely Very. nothing. What do we have Very. from Democrats? What do we have from Republicans? Uh-huh. Absolutely nothing. Our best chance of having any type of economic empowerment was through Trump because he was not a politician. He was a guy that felt like you okay, know what? Okay, Joe, I'm gonna have that vote for you. Want this, you want this? Let's give you that. Are right, you starting to bloviate on the show? So first, let me give you a historical record. Under Democratic presidents, black families earn between eight hundred and fifteen hundred dollars more annually under Democratic presidents than under Republican presidents. That's from a twenty-eight year assessment of presidencies. Also, black unemployment drops mainly under Democratic presidents, and it actually increases unemployment of blacks increases under Republican presidents, and you get paid more per dollar or on the dollar under Democratic presidents traditionally than under Republican presidents. That is a 38 year study and assessment that was done by Pew Research. Now, let me get back to your original proclamation of the $500 billion. While you criticize Joe Biden, and Joe Biden is worthy of criticism for sure, I criticize Joe Biden on policies as well. While you criticize Joe Biden, are you forgetting the fact that while you say Donald Trump had a $500 billion plan for black people, Trump could have gave us that $500 billion plan when he was in office for four damn years and he did not. He was in office for four years. However, you have no criticism for him not delivering for black people, but you have criticism for Joe Biden who just got there. Does this Joe make Biden's sense? Been in to office for 47 years. He hasn't Not been, in, has he been in office come for on, man. 47 come, years. Come on, he brother. Do you have any president. criticism? He you got any criticism for Donald Trump? For Barack Obama, who and, and again was fair a black criticism. person. So black people brother, got in office, right? As I said, he had the House and he had the Senate, and Barack criticism. Obama did absolutely nothing now, for black people. So I have a lot Joe, of criticism for Obama. I have a lot of Joe, criticism for Joe Biden. Okay, do you have any criticism for Donald Trump? Because yes, he shouldn't talk so much trash on Twitter. But Donald okay. Trump is his so own let me man. Go back. But let he me was go doing back. something for us. 
He was Let doing me go something back, for brother. us, and he got okay. the lowest total Joe. of black votes ever. Because Joe he wasn't Biden, doing Barack a damn Obama, thing based on Democrats policy. had the highest total of black votes, and you know what we got? Nothing. We got absolutely nothing from him. We got a, we got okay, a Joe, black family, a black man Joe, in office who did not care to do Joe anything Mike. for us. So here's how this is working, brother. I'm definitely trying to make sure I engage with you on a policy level, but be respectful, okay? So here's the reality of what you're talking about. Under the presidency of Barack Obama and the vice presidency of presidency of Joe Biden, you saw an increase in black employment, black business owners, household median income, household ownership, black college graduates, funding for college graduates. And I still go on record and say President Obama was no friend of HBCUs because he did not move the needle with HBCUs, but neither did Donald Trump. See, I can give the criticism fairly where it applies. You have been a talking point after talking point on this in this conversation. It is a simple question. When it comes to policy, what policy can you point to right now that helped the masses of black people from Donald Trump. Which one? Well, we could talk about prison reform. That was a real good one. How many people, how many uh -uh. black people got out of prison on uh -uh. prison reform? I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. The initiative under the White House served less than 1%, is actually 0.02% of the black population, number one. Number two, that same Justice Department decided to eliminate Pell Grant programming that allowed prisoners to actually get a college education. That same administration decided to defund halfway houses that help with the transition of black inmates into free society. And that same administration decided to prosecute Nonviolent drug offenses to the highest extent of the law based on the memo from the DOJ. So while you can talk about that one carrot stick initiative that helped a handful of black folks, we call that the microcosm. You have no policy from Donald Trump that talked or affected the macrocosm of black people in America. Well, the majority of the issues that we have when it comes to macrocosm that you talked about come from Democrats. I mean, like, look at every single law that's passed. You can look at the three strikes law. You can look at everything that everything from the Clintons. I'm completely to against the three strikes even, law. Even, it was a even, stupid even, law. Even even your even your vice president right now, she was very strict on people, marijuana offenses, lock them up in jail, truancies, lock the parents up in jail, and then she gets on the Breakfast Club and brags about smoking weed. That sounds kind of and, hit, and hit all of that. And, and remember this, uh, Joe. I have been highly critical. Uh, not only of uh, Vice President Harris when she was uh, a US Senator, uh, but also when she was running for president and now Vice President. So that's, I understand that point. But my point to you is this, you're unable to actually articulate any type of coherent message as it relates to Donald Trump. It seems as if you're drinking the same Kool-Aid. You talk a good game on one hand, but then when it comes to Donald Trump, it's like you completely lose your logic. You can talk about police reform, you say all the right things as it relates to what needs to happen in urban communities. You're connecting with the urban population, beautiful, great. But you really think Donald Trump delivered something for you? You really think Donald Trump did something for black people? Name Absolutely. it then. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, Donald Trump. I mean, you can look at the lowest unemployment. I mean, that was a good thing. We can no, look at once again, another misnomer. Another misnomer, so let me explain it to you. The administration used what's called a U3 rating system in order to determine their unemployment numbers. The real rating system is a U6 rating system. They used a U3 rating system that said if you work one hour in one survey month, you are considered to be employed. That's the rating system they used in order to promote that they actually had achieved some greatness in their employment numbers. The real rating system is a U6 rating system that showed black unemployment and underemployment between 18 to 22%. Beyond that, black people made less on the dollar Less on the dollar under the Trump administration because of the DOJ's refusal to actually go after companies that actively discriminated and did not engage in equal pay for equal work. And beyond that, the household median income for black families in the United States of America dropped by $600 a year under the Trump administration. So brother, those are facts. I'm not arguing anything but facts with you.
So if that's the case, then how come the leftist media had to run a whole media campaign about COVID-19 to stop President Trump and what he was doing for this country when it comes to the economy, when it comes to every single thing that he was pushing for? Why did they have to do that? Because that has that has never happened. I mean, we can look at Joe. You you just you look at every single president. Come on now, come on. You got to admit. The media, if you had a chance a of feeding Maxine pandemic. Waters, they you have it. just blown it. You have no they, chance. They of ran a COVID-19 election. pandemic. You oh got to admit that. You're one they of those guys? They ran a COVID-19 pandemic to shut down the president, shut down everything that he wanted to do because he was doing such a good job. They ran a media Let me campaign a for a disease that had a 0. .08 okay. contraction rate and a 99.8% recovery Joe rate. Collins. Somebody did catch the COVID. Okay, Joe Collins, uh, let me ask you this question because I think it's a fair question now. Do you think COVID-19 makes you a magnet? Do I think it makes me a magnet? Right, do you think it makes you a magnet? That's what people on the right like yourself who believe that there was some conspiracy about COVID-19. They think the vaccine actually makes you magnetize. I will send you the video. Do you think COVID-19 makes you a magnet? No, COVID-19 nor the, nor the vaccine makes you a magnet. But I can tell you this, the vaccine has not been approved for anything outside of emergency use. And okay. right now, I don't think that so we're in an emergency situation. You're for saying- a vaccine that has not been approved by the FDA. Oh, okay. How many people you think died of COVID? Uh, roughly around 500,000 if we're talking about the numbers from the CDC website. You don't think that's an emergency? That is not an emergency because the majority of the people, if you look, if you read it, it says the majority of the people die from pre-existing conditions coupled oh. with COVID-19. You are not incorrect. Not from COVID-19. I think what you we're incorrect. talking about is how let we're going to tell you where you're incorrect. the people who live in these communities. Okay, let me tell you where you're incorrect. Individuals that have pre-existing conditions, Underlying Our health issues. Let, let me let me finish, brother. People that had these health issues, yes, COVID nineteen made it worse for them. They didn't die from the health issue. It's called the but for qualification. Meaning, if it had not been but for COVID, they would be alive. They had heart issues. Some of them had respiratory function issues. Some of them had compromised immune systems, and some of them did not. Some children had some health issues, but would have survived if it had not been for COVID-19. So brother, how dare you no, say no, that, no, that COVID-19 not. was absolutely not a determination. Not. You know now, how many families you. had to do Zoom funerals because of COVID-19? And you're saying that this was some made up conspiracy uh, promoted by the left wing media? What I said was they pushed the media campaign. Don't put words in my mouth right now. And when they were talking about the hydroxychloroquine coupled with the other medication that could have cured everything, what they do, they stopped selling it. And then they start selling a manufactured vaccine that has not been proven to do anything for anybody. So how dare you? Okay, okay? you brother, can't, you cannot Joe, say that not not Joe, one bit that hydrochloroquine happened. Hydrochloroquine that, happened you can't say that it, it, it was meant you, to happen because you need not. to correct yourself on something. Hydrochloroquine was never meant to be a cure, so don't use that it, word. It, it, I never it, said it was a cure. It, it was worked. meant. It, it was worked. meant. No, it, it did worked. not work, sir. It did not yes, work in did. every sir. Yes, it did. Sir, we can argue. We can debate opinion, brother. We can't show, debate we'll facts. It. it did not. It did not work in all of the trial studies. It worked for some. It did not you know, work for others. So, you know brother, when you say work? it worked, vaccine. The vaccine didn't work either. Well, you're, the, you're the vaccine. People with the, a vaccine that hasn't on. been proven. Every so, single so animal trial that the vaccine was tested on has failed. Have you been? Come on, man. That's. Have you been vaccinated? It's true. It's true. You've been vaccinated, brother. No, I'm not. I'm not about to put a foreign substance in my body. I'm not. So about why to get did Donald vaccine. Trump get vaccinated? That Donald Trump probably did get vaccinated, but I'm not. But Donald he did. Trump. He I'm said he did. Why, why did he get vaccinated? Body. I'm just asking. Why did he get vaccinated? I don't know. I'm not him, but I wouldn't do it. <laughs> All right, brother. All right, you you would never be in the studio with me, brother. But Joe, I appreciate you. Thank you for being on Indisputable. How can people follow you on Twitter? Uh, Joe E. Collins three, and again, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, man. It's been um, interesting. <laughs> All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, be good to yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. And remember, the truth is always indisputable. <laughs>